Michael and welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. Thank you. You know, your work throughout the years has been nothing short of exceptional, and your music has genuinely served as the soundtrack of my childhood. So I'd like to start by thanking you for joining me for a conversation slash listening party today. Great. Thank you. Really glad to be here. So let's start at the beginning. How did you get into music? Yeah, um, I think, you know, my mom got me going in music really young. Uh, the first, my first actual composing work was when I was a toddler. My mom got me a, uh, a little toy organ about this big electric organ, this big wide. And yeah, I'd, I'd bang on the keys, but really what interested me were those six buttons on the left. So it was like a C major, D minor, F major, G major, A minor, maybe E minor, those six chords. And you press the button and you get this just rich chord. And I just spend hours playing different chord progressions by pressing those six buttons. And I think that was where I first developed a sense of like, wow, chords are really cool. Um, and then, of course, you know, starting at age five, I, uh, I was forced to take piano lessons. Um, like all of us. Like everybody. And uh, like, like many of us, uh, I didn't uh, practice enough. So Saturday morning was always, you know, terrifying and stressful, uh, you know, going to the lesson. Uh, and uh, did that till I was about 12 and then uh, quit quit piano. And that was actually when I actually really started playing piano, when I quit piano lessons. Because at that point, I, I would uh, just improvise and I would do simple things like, you know, uh, you know, a, a Phrygian pattern in the left hand and then sort of Spanish kind of melodies in the right hand and little simple things like that. Uh, but just enough to kind of start to really feel the instrument more than when you're just sort of reading notes and mechanically trying to reproduce them. Um, and, uh, I also learned a few things just that I really love. Like my mom early on, she was a pianist and she played the funeral march, uh, by Chopin, a beautiful piece. And, um, so I learned that when I was a kid and I, you know, that was not a chore. That was a labor of love. And I, I, I really loved that piece. Moonlight Sonata was another one sort of in that similar vein. Um, but then, uh, when I was four, 13, 14 years old, I went to camp. And when I was at camp, I saw this uh, one night in the in the dining hall, there was this rock band of older kids uh, practicing up on a stage. And I went down and I stuck my head in front of the bass amplifier and spent the whole t night just with my head in front of the bass amplifier. I was like, wow, this is really cool. I want to play the electric bass. And so I just kept begging me, begging, begging my mom to get me an electric bass. Eventually, uh, you know, the, the stars aligned. I, I got the right point of leverage and, and she got me one and started getting me bass lessons. And from there, I just dove headfirst into the electric bass. Uh, and, you know, initially I, uh, you know, played rock and you know, Rolling Stones, sort of your your most sort of typical bass stuff. And then got a little further, got into like Yes with Chris Squire and his amazing melodic lines. And then um, at some point, uh, uh, I guess, uh, last couple of years of high school, I got very heavily into The Grateful Dead and Phil Lesh's bass playing, which really like hits you in the chest and it's a whole other kind of experience. And uh, so that really, uh, you know, set a direction there. And uh, meanwhile, sort of around that time, uh, I uh, in college, I uh, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be accepted into a uh, a class being taught by Ivan Cherepnin, who is a really great composer from or was a great composer from a great family of composers, and uh, the class was uh, electronic music, and so. He, uh, his brother actually was one of the pioneers of modular synthesis. And so he was an amazing, just visionary for how to use um, modular synthesizers and tape music and all the sort of classic techniques of, uh, you know, electronic music prior to the digital age. So it was all analog and uh, got heavily into that, uh, made, made a few pieces that, that were really kind of, kind of beautiful and interesting. And, um, that uh, 
you know, was a great experience that kind of opened up my ears to sort of the, the wider realm of, of, you know, sound and, and music as one big space. And then, uh, let's see, after that, I got a job. I went actually that from there, I went to Mills College. Uh, and uh, so undergrad, I was at Harvard. And that was the uh, electronic music studio there that was um, just, you know, a small little tiny studio in the middle of a very um, uh, dyed in the wool department. So it was like the rebels. But then I went to Mills College. And it was a whole program of uh, in, as, as grad school as a whole program of uh, electronic music in what was called the Center for Contemporary Music, but in in fact it it really been um, originally originally there was this avant garde group in San Francisco called the Tate Music Center of San Francisco, and they uh, needed a, essentially a facility, a place to call their home, and Mills gave them essentially a building or half of a building, and so they set up this center, and that was like an avant garde mecca of all of the um, you know electronic music pioneers coming through there, um, giving concerts, giving lectures. Uh, I met a lot of you know great um, you know innovators at, in that time. Funny thing is though, um, I didn't really do music there because the, there was such a uh, such an avant-garde aesthetic that it was so harsh to the ears. I, there was a, a sense to me that uh, the more difficult it was to listen to, the more valued it was. And that just didn't really align with, you know, the little kid who pressed the buttons on the toy organ, right? And so uh, I ended up building a synthesizer or rebuilding a synthesizer with a digital interface. And that's when I learned computers. And... Um, you know, finally, after a couple of years, I was actually, I really did start to appreciate the, um, how do I say it, the mathematical, intellectual, sort of perceptual um, aspects of that music. As harsh as it was, I started to actually like it. So that was, you know, it, eventually my aesthetics grew even further to encompass that. And then after that, I went back to, that was in California in Oakland. Um, I went, after that, I went back to uh, Massachusetts and got a job at Lexicon doing more computer stuff. And uh, essentially, I, I programmed like operating systems for little MIDI controllers and things like that. And um, then uh, from there, uh, I decided to move back to California because so, I missed so it. So the thing that motivated you to explore computer programming alongside your ongoing passion for music was your willingness to, to learn something that will help you program synthesizers? That's exactly right. Yeah, because I had this analog synthesizer, a Serge system built by Serge Shrepnin. Um, and uh, it was, um, I was like, you know, wouldn't it be cool to make a digital interface so you can, because <clears throat> the thing about analog synthesis is it's completely not repeatable. It's just, you know, you're in, you're sailing basically, uh, <clears throat> you know, your patch cords and knobs and no keys, just, you know, total abstract stuff. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a, a, a computer interface so that you could recreate, um, you know, these fleeting experiences that you get from an analog synthesizer. And so that became my, my thesis project at Mills. And I had to learn programming and learn, you know, low level digital circuitry. And I basically just sort of rolled up my sleeves and, and built the thing and that in the process became <clears throat> a technologist. So I went to, <clears throat> I went to electronic music school and ended up becoming a technologist, <laughs> kind of, kind of a curveball. Uh, but then, uh, you know, and so then with those technical skills, I was able to get a job as a programmer at Lexicon which was a great place to work because there was just some, you know, amazing uh, technologists there. Uh, some great folks from MIT, you know, uh, worked there. And I learned a ton about computer programming from a guy I shared an office with who was really visionary. And uh, <clears throat> after that, I was like, you know, I just miss California so much. So I moved back to California, still working as a consultant for Lexicon. And then that sort of that consultant work eventually kind of tapered off. And I was like, okay, I got to get a job. And, you know, my mom was like, well, you know, you should look in the newspaper. I was like, come on, there aren't any good jobs in the newspaper. And then, uh, so I looked and there was this thing that said, you know, sound design, C8086. And I was like, wait a minute, sound and computer programming. Hey, I can do that. So I applied and it turned out to be uh, the job at LucasArts. That was, uh, 
uh, you know, David Fox was the hiring manager and, you know, I was interviewed by Noah and, you know, Brian Moriarty, all those folks were, were there at the time. Um, and, uh, I got the job. So, and, uh, you know, it's funny thing about the, the getting the job because, uh, I think I did well in the interview, uh, but my, um, uh, you know, and it was actually interesting because they had worked with a, a really great consultant, Dave Warhol, who had done their their sound uh, code before, but I think for some reason he wasn't able to continue doing that. So they needed somebody who could do both, you know, the sound design, maybe a little bit of music and also write the low level sound drivers. And I could do all that. And, you know, I was like, I like, I want to work from the top to the bottom. I, you know, the whole stack that I want to take responsibility. So they were like, great, let's give it to this guy. Um, but the one piece that, that didn't quite fit right away was my demo tape. Cause my demo tape had a lot of, uh, you know, sort of abstract sort of, uh, you know, some of it was pretty, but most of, but n none of it was, you know, sort of like what you would think of as music for picture, which is a whole other deal than just, you know, abstract music. And so, um, after the interview, some during the interview, I remember Noah mentioning something about a game having some Nazis in it. And I was like, ah, I know what to do. So I went back uh, to my apartment and I wrote a, a Nazi theme. Um, and uh, I sent it in and said, you know, just so you know, I can write quote unquote normal music. You know, here here's a Nazi march. And uh, that ended up becoming the main theme for Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe. That actually shipped in a game. So that all worked out pretty well. So when did you start working at the LucasArts exactly? That was uh, spring of 1990. And I worked there until spring of 2000. So, you know, almost exactly 10 years. And what was your first day at LucasArts like? Oh, boy. It was, you know, it's, it's kind of awe-inspiring. Um, the, uh, you know, Skywalker Ranch is in a just an amazing place. And so, you know, they give you the the tour and you see, you know, oh, look, there's an actual lightsaber in a cabinet and oh, you know, this and that and stuff that's like, you know, you look at it and you go, oh my God, that's, that's the real thing. You know, a little X-Wing model that like, oh, that's from the movie, right? So things like that are kind of um, amazing. The, the main house is just, the architecture is you know, it's unbelievable because it's, it, it, you know, when George built his ranch, he, uh, he started with a story as you would sort of expect from someone like George of, of a sea captain who had some daughters and blah, blah, blah. And so it, it, it really had this feeling to it of it's old, but also kind of, I mean, brand new and of amazing quality, but it had this sort of kind of old Gothic, not quite Gothic, but just this old sort of architectural quality to it. When you walk through, you're just like this, I've never seen any place like this. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, oh, here's a grand piano. And, you know, by the way, if there's a, if there's a sign that says reserved for Linda, that means Linda Ronstadt needs to come down and play it. So, you know, stuff like that just kind of makes you go, whoa. And, um, and we were working at the time in the carriage house. Uh, so the games group was called Lucasfilm Games at that time. And so that was a, you know, a beautiful facility. Um, but they didn't have any room for me there. So they set me up in the, in the I think they called it the Bridge House, which is a, a different building a little ways away. And uh, so I had, you know, a little studio that I set up outside on a kind of a patio, closed patio uh, above a brook. And, uh, you know, it was just like unbelievably idyllic. And, you know, and, and yet the security is, you know, you don't see the security, but there's incredible security. So it was just, he just nailed everything. They did it all right. So it's awe inspiring and, and beautiful. And I was just like, I'm amazed and felt so lucky to be there. And what was the first project you worked on at LucasArts? The first, you know, I, we shipped that, that German March, but that wasn't something I worked on as an employee. I did that prior to being an employee. Monkey Island was the first thing I worked on there. And I think the Monkey Island theme was the, was the first tune I wrote. So um, it kind of started at the top and went down from there. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, I, I remember um, the, the game was um, in production and, uh, you know, it was, I think it was pretty far along. It was going to be released that year, at the end of the year. And uh, so it was like a scramble, you know. But the other thing about it is that um, 
you know, we used the the old uh, sound drivers that um, had been done by Dave Warhol. I didn't have to write any code for that game. It was only music. And there wasn't a ton of music. And we also had an outside group called Earwax uh, that helped with some of the pieces. Um, so uh, that was uh, Andy Newell and uh, Barney Jones. And, um, you know, the... Uh, it was really, you know, I had like a DX7, but the um, as a as a keyboard controller, and um, the I forget what was. I think the sounds were driven ad lib sounds, if I remember correctly. So it was kind of like very low tech, uh, and of course, you also had to uh, ship. Actually, no, now I remember it was, we did, I was working off of an MT32. So, you, you know, you'd compose for the MT32 and um, then that would be like the definitive version that maybe 5% of the audience would have. And then uh, there was, uh, you'd have to reduce it down for the ad lib version, which maybe 80% of the audio had, which was yeah, okay. But now you're talking like, you know, a little more toward the realm of beep, bleeps and bloops, but still perceptible as different instruments with different timbres and polyphony and all that. And then the third version that we had to do was the uh, PC internal speaker. And of course, that was a monophonic square wave. So it was actually kind of a, uh, always a little puzzle because you, what you would have to do is, uh, you know, figure out how to get the bass and the melody to happen at different times. So whatever the melody was, you plopped the bass notes in between those melody notes. And then with whatever gaps were left over, you would do a little flam chord, like a little three note chord, but one after another. Uh, and, you know, you could get some pretty good you know, renditions of things that were recognizable that way, but it was, it was a real challenge. Now, around the same time, we'll talk about the secret of my calendar in a minute, but around the same time, a game called Night Shift was also released by LucasArts and right. you're credited for music adaptation. What can you tell us about that adaptation? Boy, I have to be honest. My memory of a lot of things is pretty foggy. Um, Let me I, jog your memory. Okay. you forget working on such a masterpiece wow no i remember that i mean the the music rings the bell i i know that tune for sure um i don't think i don't think i wrote it i don't know i don't know who wrote yeah, it yeah you adapted it yeah it might have been written by earwax it kind of sounds a little bit like an earwax kind of tune um but i couldn't say for sure uh but yeah that's uh and was that was probably an ad lib version, I'm guessing, um, or CMS. There was another thing that was sort of similar to an ad lib, but wasn't quite the same. Uh, but yeah, that uh, I definitely remember that tune. Yeah, it's a cute little tune. The music is credited to David Lowe. David Lowe. I don't know who that is. I can't remember. I don't know. Maybe they contracted that out and had the had the tune, and you know, maybe I'm. I'm guessing maybe it was, I don't know if the game was done in-house at LucasArts or if it was, you know, working with an external team, but maybe he was part of an external team, I'm guessing. Night Shift and The Secret of Monkey Island both came out in October of 1919. And since you, came, since you joined Lucasfilm Games around spring 1919, then that means that you joined around the same time when they just released Loom. That's right. Yeah. Loom had just gotten out or was, yes, right around then. Yeah. It was uh, beautiful. I remember loving that one. Yeah. Swan Lake. Yeah. So as you said on The Secret of Monkey Island, you're credited for music along with Barney Jones and Andy Newell 
from Earwax yeah. Productions. And Patrick Mundy. Patrick Mundy, yes. He was a tester and he did uh, one of the tunes. He was, um, it was the Jungle Tune. He did the original version of the Jungle Tune and then I reworked it a little bit. But yeah, that was his original concept. And what was Barney and Andy's contribution to the soundtrack? So, yeah. Uh, Barney did the uh, Scumbar theme. Andy did uh, the that organ piece in the church, uh, and um, I think what else? Uh, the the either or both of them together did the circus theme, um, and I'm not sure what else off the top of my head, but I know that they did those three. Awesome. And you talked about composing the main theme of Monk Island. Can you shed some light on the process? of composing this iconic theme? Yeah. Um, so, uh, it just, you know, I was, you know, in my apartment one day and I was you know, not trying to compose anything. Um, I was just, uh, noodling on, it was an organ patch on a DX seven, just, you know, typical sort of synth organ patch along with some digital delay that kind of gave it a kind of an echoey thing. And so I started kind of playing a reggae groove with it and junk, 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 kind of that kind of thing. And, um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, by the way, that one of my musical adventures early on was, uh, very relevant to Monkey Island, which is I had, um, played keyboards. Uh, I got a gig somehow through some connection, uh, in a, just, just for one, a one night show, uh, with a guy named Josiah uh, Kintock, who uh, was it was a one of the percussionists in Bob Marley's band, and then went off to do his own his own stuff, and uh, so I was playing keyboards, not bass. Um, they had a, a, an amazing reggae bass player, and this guy, you know, and, but but I got like this. How do I say it? Uh, it was so authentic working, you know, they they also had a drummer, I forget the drummer, but the, these two guys, the bass and then Josiah on percussion, uh, they, they embodied the reggae music in a way that, you, you know, you don't normally get access to as like, you know, a white guy in the suburbs, you know, you can listen to Bob Marley, but it's not the same because like Josiah was saying things like, you know, my hands, I can tell stories with my hands. And, and he did like he, the way he would do his fills were like little stories. And then like talking to this bass player who was like, yeah, the difference between the way uh, white bass players and black bass players play reggae is that, you know, white bass player, you know, emphasizes the two and it sounds like it's a two of the, of the four beat measure. Whereas with a black bass player, he'll put the emphasis in the play, same place, but it feels like it's the one. Uh, it feels like a downbeat and, and it was like stuff like that. So th those were the sort of building blocks that I took when I was doing the Monkey Island score. I had, you know, sort of, how do I say it? I, I, I had been given the keys to unlock, you know, how to make reggae seem authentic. And so, um, so anyway, so I was playing along one day on, on these, you know, sort of reggae S chords, you know, sort of me minor and this, and the melody just, I just started playing the melody, the beginning of the melody. And the funny thing is it, it just kept going. Like it was literally, I started playing the melody and I didn't, and I just played it right through all the way, not the bridge, but just the main melody all the way beginning to end just in a single shot, just as an improv. And I stopped, I was like, wait a minute, that was pretty cool. I better not forget that. And so I did, ran it a couple of times. I was like, wow, this, this really has a good, this really loops around kind of nice. Cause I knew it was like, you know, kind of unique. And uh, so uh, I think I kind of knew at that point, you know, this might make a good main theme for that pirate reggae game. Um, and so, I think I, you know, uh, I brought it to Ron in, in a rough form, and he, I think, approved it, and uh, and so then I uh, dressed it up. Then I, you know, went to work with the MT32, and I think it took about two weeks. Uh, and part of that was actually writing the bridge. One of the hardest parts was writing the ending. It was like a TV ending. It was really quick, but it also kind of really tight. And um, 
you know, it was uh, extremely detailed work on the MT32. Like uh, every single part, I just, you know, really crafted and um, made sure they all fit together like a little machine. And the end result sounded very organic, but it was, you know, extremely, you know, uh, precisely worked up, even though it kind of had a somewhat organic sound. You know, I get that a lot from my interviews with LucasArts legends like yourself. When I ask about an iconic scene or an iconic line, or in your case, an iconic theme, I usually expect them to say, I worked on that for five months in a row until it was perfect. Instead, I get answers like, yeah, it just came to me and it was done in 15 minutes, or I just thought of it and put it on paper and that was it. Yeah. So I see it's that the, the Monkey Island theme is no different in this case. Yeah, it was, I, you know, it was just sort of, it dropped in my lap and I, I had the presence of mind to, you know, trap it basically, <laughs> not let it scurry away. <laughs> Seems like lightning struck twice a day at LucasArts. There was a lot of, a lot of creativity. I mean, that was one thing about the place is that, uh, you know, creativity was part of the business model. It wasn't something that you had to justify. You know, it was just expected. I mean, in addition to the theme, you have LeChuck's theme, which is also a fan favorite. What inspired its eerie and unforgettable melody? Oh, boy, that's another one. Um, you know, I was, I was, by this time we were in a building in uh, the Kerner facility, so off of the ranch. And, um, I was in my office, which is a studio, sort of semi-studio, um, thinking to myself, okay, now I have to write the LeChuck theme. I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I was like, oh, I have no idea. So I just was like, but first I got to go take a pee. So I went out to the bathroom and I'm standing at the urinal. And while I'm taking a pee at the urinal, the theme literally just popped into my head, just the way you know. Come on. I'm not kidding you. I, I believe you, but the thing is that it always happens this way at LucasArts. It seems like. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. That was another one. It's just, you know, it's funny. The two most iconic ones are the two that came the quickest. Yeah. Which probably is the reason why they're so iconic. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all about setting up the environment to be able to receive it, right? Because it's really hard in, in modern life to, you know, create a, a, a state of being where you can be uh, receptive to creative ideas where you're not, you know, feeling stress or feeling like you need to deliver or feeling like you have, you're pressed for time or whatever. And the funny thing is, even, even under those circumstances, the ideas can come. It's really just a matter of a lot of it is actually being in, in a flow where you have the, the percolating musical energies inside you all the time percolating. And then, you know, you have to, a, a, a big part of it is noticing when you have something worth keeping, right? Because, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're percolating music all the time, you've got source material being generated literally, you know, almost every waking minute, right? But the trick is to know when, oh, wait, that's something that you want to actually grab hold of and, you know, develop. That's a key. That's why all the good ideas come to you in the shower. Yeah. Because your mind is at ease. And so you're willing to accept new ideas or reinvent stuff that you've already thought of in the past. Yeah. Now, moving on to 1991, we'll get back to Monk Island in 1992 in the CD version, but for now, let's move on to 1991. In 1991, Master Blazer came out and you're credited for sound in the DOS version of Master Blazer. What specific contributions did you make to that game? Honestly, I don't remember, to be perfectly honest. My, like I have a, a lot of fogginess about certain things, but other things I remember clearly. And, and I don't remember specifically what sound design I did, but I'm, I'm guessing it oh, was... That's why I'm here. Yeah, okay. To remind cool. you. Awesome. So this is Master Blazer.
here, sound like a land. There you are. All right. Sound like a land. So let let me skip. So does any of this ring a bell literally? The the tunes not so much. Um, I mean, it sounds familiar, but I maybe don't. the sound. Let's yeah, I mean, hear some gameplay. Yeah, let's hear some gameplay. Wait. Anything? I might. I'm. I'm guessing that I made those. You know, those ad lib sort of snare hits and things like that. I mean, that was a lot of times. What would happen is somebody would compose a piece, provide a MIDI file, and then you have to say, "Okay, make this sound good on an ad lib card." So it might have just been that. Might that, that sounds like what I would have done for that? I can't remember okay. specifically, but I think that would be what would make the most sense. Yeah, I'm guessing somebody generated MIDI files and said. Here you go. Make it make it play an ad lib. Okay. And the same year, 1991, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe was released, and you were created there for music and sound effects. Now, as you said before, you were in charge of the main theme, which you composed for your job interview. Yeah. Don't tell me it came to you in the shower. No, that one was a bit of a that one was a grind, but I got it to work. Do you, 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 I don't suppose you have a, a version of it I could hear. I haven't heard it for a really long of time. Of course I have. In the credits, it says that you're credited. We saw that sound effects and music by Michael Land and Peter Lincroft. Yeah, Peter Lincroft was the um, programmer that worked with Larry Holland on this. And so I'm guessing he did uh, probably worked pretty well on the sound effects. I mean, I, I, I'm sure he did the sound effects engine and he might have done some of the sound effects themselves, or, or maybe it was like I did the, you know, I put the. Uh, the voices in place and he he provided the engine that the voices ran on i'm guessing it was something like that okay because otherwise it should have been sound effects peter linkroft and music by michael land yeah yeah i don't know that he was uh, a a sound designer per se but I, I know he probably did the engine for that yeah that and that piece is you can you can start to hear like there's a lot of modulation in that piece it changes keys quite a bit for for a march <laughs> and so that's kind of one of the things that i you know always gravitate towards is is key changes so the theme you wrote in your job interview in 1990 was used as is in this 1991 version or yeah same exact it changed no it was the exact same uh notes but this was the ad-lib version that also had the uh, mp32 version of course I, I wrote it originally on the mp32 which sounds a lot more like a real brass band in 1991 you also worked on imus now before we get into monk island 2 i want us to talk about the creation of imus first yeah what inspired the idea of creating a a dynamic music system like iMuse, and what goal we're trying to achieve by creating it. So, really, it was necessity being the mother of invention. Uh, so, in Monkey Island One, the uh, you know the traditional music engines for games, you had two things you could do. You could make it loop, 
and you could make it fade out uh, in addition to just start and stop. And that was very limiting because, you know, the game itself had so much dramatic richness and so many just gorgeous sets uh, by Peter Chan and just, you know, it had so much going for it in the other media that, you know, comprise a game, but, but the music, you know, the, the notes were, were nice. I mean, the, 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 the tunes were good, but the ability of the tunes to conform to the game were extremely limited. And so, uh, that was the motivation is to say, no, wait a minute. We want to be able to have the music actually support the game dynamically so that, you know, it's not just start the loop, stop the loop, but you can do other things. And what would those other things be? Uh, those would be, um, having the music seamlessly transition from one part of the music to another part of the music based on something that happens in the game or having the texture of the music get thicker or thinner, adding and removing instruments, changing the orchestration, uh, depending upon what was going on in the game. Those were really the two main uh, aspects of, of improvement. We, we thought of the first one as being horizontal, meaning you're going to some other place in the score based on gameplay. And uh, the other being vertical, meaning you're, you're layering the layer cake differently depending upon what's going on in the game. And, and believe me, horizontal and vertical covers a lot of ground. <laughs> so, um, that was the, you know, original motivation. And, uh, you know, I think it was probably around January-ish of uh, 91 where I, I wrote up a, I was like, okay, I think I know what this, what's needed here. I wrote up a specification like a 30 page document saying, okay, it needs all these function calls and all these capabilities. And I looked at this thing, I was like, I can't do this alone and score the game. And so uh, I called up Peter McConnell, who was an old friend of mine. Um, we'd gone to college together and uh, played in bands together and we worked at Lexicon together. So we had a lot of history. We, we lived together in an apartment at one time. So uh, I knew he was the right guy. He also had, uh, you know, uh, programming skills and composing skills. Um, and, uh, you know, basically brought him in and, uh, he, he got, you know, hired at Lucas and, um, we set out to build the system together. And, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, initially split up the work where, uh, he would do the authoring tool. We called it. So at that time in Lucas, there was a tradition of, of naming the various tools for bodily fluids. Uh, and so they had, you know, uh, a tool called earwax that they had done that they used for auditioning sounds using the old, uh, sound driver. And so we thought, okay, well, we're going to get the wax out of the ears here. So we're going to call this tool Q-tip. So we called this tool Q-tip. And so Peter wrote uh, Q-tip and I wrote the uh, the underlying engine. It was basically a MIDI based engine, a MIDI player uh, that um, had the ability to uh, interpret system exclusive uh, messages. So system ex in the MIDI stream, you have note on, note off, you know, different kinds of controllers for pitch pen. You also have these things called system exclusive messages which means it's a message that is designed specifically for some system. It's like a private message. And so we used these system exclusive messages embedded in the MIDI data in order to uh, essentially convey different either commands or, you know, uh, split points, you know, points of, of divergence where you could, you know, jump from one location in the music to another, because you can't just, in music, you can't just, you know, if you just are at some random moment in the music and you decide to jump to some other location, it's not going to sound good because it's just not, the beats aren't going to align. Maybe the melodies aren't going to align. And so you have to be able to uh, restrict the, the choices to something more like a grid work. And so these system exclusive messages provided that grid work. And they also provided, uh, the ability at certain points in the music to turn on and off a melody. Like if you're, if you have a melody that you're going to either be turning on and off dynamically, you can't usually just start that melody at any random spot because it's just not going to be the melody. If you 
start three notes in. You have to start either at the beginning or, you know, it has a natural phrase, which pauses and that you, that's another spot where you can enter or exit. So, you know, you want to have these melodies have integrity. And so you have to manually as a composer decide uh, which spots in the, in the music are going to be able to, you know, jump horizontally to another spot or which spots in the music are you going to be able to turn on and off different parts? And so that was all handled in Swiss and exclusive messages that were interpreted on the fly as the MIDI was playing. So the MIDI is playing all the music, but it's also simultaneously interpreting these messages as to sort of the, the meta plan for what the music can do. Um, and so that was a ton of work. Um, <clears throat> And we, uh, you know, worked on that all spring, I think into the summer. And of course, at that point, the schedule is starting to look pretty scary because this game's going to ship in the fall. And so at that point, we we're like, we need Clint. So we also, you know, Clint was an old friend of mine from high school. Peter and I knew him. We, again, the three of us had played in bands together. So um, <clears throat> we brought in Clint as, as an extra composer. Uh, and also, I think he did a lot of the sound design as well in, in Monkey Tool. I'm not sure. And um, <clears throat> so that was the uh, the technical process to get the system done. And then, of course, you know, we had made a commitment with Ron. Ron signed off and thought it was a good idea to do wall-to-wall -wall music in Monkey 2, meaning, you know, we didn't want there to be big chunks of silence. It just didn't feel right. So... We committed to doing a ton of music. We committed to doing a complex new uh, technical system underlying the music. And we started, you know, churning out the, and we had to, you know, ship it for three different um, platforms, you know, the Roland that we composed on, the AdLib and the PC internal speaker. So we brought in a few couple of other people to help with the conversions of those. And uh, it was a big production, and the 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 practically the toughest part was um, the the fact that integrating the commands to command the music to do this and that at different times was done in was done by the game programmer. So the game programmers would literally have to know, okay, set this particular jump hook at this moment or turn on and off this particular part at this moment. There's a lot of interface, just a, a ton of time where we're sitting over the game programmer's shoulder saying, no, no, that didn't work right. Let's look at the code. Let's try to, you know, try that a little differently. Uh, and it was kind of sheer madness. And it's sort of along with that, I, I, I did the whole wood tick thing where there was like a separate ending for every one of like, you know, every two measures, there was a different ending on a, on a piece that had like six different iterations. So it was like, you know, 150 different endings so that everything worked smoothly. And just the amount of audaciousness really to, to be able to think we could actually pull that off was kind of crazy. And it was extremely stressful. But finally, you know, we did manage to pull all those threads together and, and get it done. And, and, you know, we, proudly didn't delay the game's shipment, which was the big red line you never want to cross. Uh, and so, yeah, that was a, a massive effort. And it, and it, you know, the funny thing is that after all that effort and all that work and creating such a, uh, you know, innovative, seamless score with, you know, uh, a lot of really fun tunes in them and they all, you know, molded to the game really quickly, there was crickets from the uh you know the 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 public as far as hardly anybody really noticed that the music was doing anything special and you know we said to ourselves you know that probably means we did our job right because everybody feels like the music is just the way it should be so they don't even notice it and so we you know over the years of course there's been a lot of you know lingering recognition of what that achievement was but at the time it was it was interesting we thought there'd be a lot more uh, appreciation for for the for for what it took to get there, but it, it I think it just sort of faded into the overall texture of the game, which is ultimately a good thing. Now, what specific techniques or algorithms does iMuse utilize in order to smoothly transition between the different musical tracks in real time? So it's all composer defined. So uh, there are no algorithms. It's literally the composer will uh, 
say you're writing a piece of music and there's like a, a great example I think is the Largo music at the beginning where there's a bridge uh, to the mm -hmm. tune, uh, but you don't actually get into the bridge of the tune and Till I think it's when he starts beating you up or something along those lines where there's something that happens in the exactly. game and then, yeah. and then you get to the bridge. Um, so you don't have any idea how long it will be before that event occurs. So you write a loop and it's just, a, you know, the, the A section is a loop and then the B section is what you want to get to and you have to decide as a composer, okay, here is a spot where the A section can be left and jump into the B section and here's another spot and here's another spot and you consciously choose which spots you will allow that to happen and hopefully they're close enough together that you know it can at least be somewhat responsive it doesn't have to be instantaneous because then it wouldn't be on rhythm but you want to you know have it close enough where you're not going to have to wait 10 seconds in order to see it happen, um, hear it happen. And then you place those system exclusive messages, like I mentioned, those system exclusive messages get embedded by the composer at those particular spots. And the, the, each message basically says, when such an, you know, when such a, uh, and such and such a number gets triggered, because they're just based on numbers, when, you know, when number three gets set, then you will not just continue, you'll instead, you will jump to this other location that is at this particular measure. So it literally has the destination of where the jump is and a, a, what we call the jump hook, which is just a number that enables that jump. And, and how did iMuse interact with the Scum engine behind the scenes and how difficult was it to integrate it with the other game engines that used it afterwards? So that was a, that was like the other that was like the main lesson we learned from Monkey Island 2 which was that the integration aspect of it was brutal because we didn't have any intermediate layer of abstraction it was all the low level music commands were executed from within the game code directly. And so you had to be sitting there with the programmer of the game, telling them what to do when and checking it and tweaking it and all that stuff uh, in order to see how it worked in the game. And that was probably the biggest thing that we said needed to be fixed for the next round of work. And so what we did is after Monkey 2, we instituted a layer in between an abstraction layer, which we called essentially states and sequences. So a state was something that could happen indefinitely. And a sequence was something that would occur for some period of time and then revert back to whatever state it emerged from. Unless, of course, you change the state while you're in the sequence and it goes to the new state. And so that at that point, we were, you know, so for subsequent games, we used that mechanism for the interface between the game and the uh, music engine, which is, by the way, kind of, you know, the way things like FMOD and WISE generally work. It's sort of become a kind of a standard way of doing things because it just makes sense. You don't want the game programmer to have to know the musical details uh, of the music in order to make the music respond. You want to basically come up with a common language that both the game and the music system can understand and reduce their interactions down to just communicating through that common language, which in our case, we call the states and the sequences. So the game program would say, we'd say to the game program, okay, when you go to this place, set this state. And when this happens, trigger this sequence. And then, you know, you revert back to that state. And then when you go to this other location, set this other state. And then when you go to this, when this other thing happens, set this sequence. And while the sequence is playing, set this new state so that it reverts back to the new state. And so then things worked a whole lot easier between us and the game programmers because we could just give them those simple instructions to trigger those simple commands. And we had this layer in, in between, this abstraction layer that would translate from those simple commands into the actual puppet strings that we needed to pull in order to make the game engine do what it does. So in Monkey 2, iMuse was part of the code for the Scum game. And afterwards, you just encapsulated it and added an API so that other game engines could use it while having an easier interface to use. Yeah, exactly. It, we, we, 
I mean, it was, you know, abstraction layer is usually the term that they use for that sort of thing because it's it was still a separate engine back in Monkey 2, but the, the API was really complicated because the API had all the details. That, and that API was what was called from the game engine. So what we did is we added another layer in between with a really simple API that inside of there is where it called the more complicated API of, of the music engine. And in what ways does iMuse manage memory and resource allocation? For example, in locations where there's a variety of musical themes that can transition from and to dynamically during the gameplay? Well, the, the beauty of MIDI is that it, it, it's extremely compact. Um, so we really never had to think about, uh, at least during the MIDI years, it was different back, you know, in something like the dig where there was, uh, you know, streamed audio. But in in the MIDI uh, in the MIDI years, um, MIDI is so incredibly compact because you are, it's like a it's like a player piano roll. It literally just says note ons and note offs and how long to you know wait in between. And so we just never had any issues with uh, you know memory, which is of course a huge thing in games, but. Because MIDI is so compact, it wasn't. A, it was never a problem. We never even had to. You know, that was never a limit that we ran into. And on November twenty fifth, nineteen ninety one, iMuse was patented. What prompted the decision to patent this particular technology? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, at the time. Uh, I believe Lucas Arts, or then it was Lucasfilm Games, and I think this, I think this actually now that I remember correctly, yeah, it was a transition period because Monkey Two was released with both Lucasfilm Games and Lucas Arts. In right. the game, it was Lucas Arts, but on the cover art, it said Lucasfilm Games. And below that, it would say Lucas Arts. Right. Yeah. What What happened is uh, Lucasfilm got. Uh, turned into Luca, like George had all these other, you know, ILM and Skywalker Sound. So initially all of those were LucasArts. LucasArts was like the whole kit and caboodle, except for uh, George's filmmaking and his licensing, which still retained the, tame, the name Lucasfilm. And, but all the other service organizations became LucasArts and Lucasfilm Games was essentially a subsidiary of LucasArts. Eventually, a few years later, Lucasfilm Games inherited the name LucasArts and all those other things just went by their own name. So now ILM is ILM, Skywalker Sound is Skywalker Sound. There's, you know, there's no overarching umbrella, at least publicly, that, that above those names. Um, so, uh, and so, interestingly, the thing that actually ultimately motivated the, uh, the patent uh, effort was um you remember um you know in the early 90s there were these tv commercials where everything started morphing where you know this the visual morph where like you know the the, the person would turn into a cat or whatever that stuff so um ilm invented that technique i think it was for the abyss but i'm not sure where exactly which movie they invented it for uh and didn't bother to patent it. And then everybody started to do it everywhere. And, you know, the people at Lucasfilm were like, boom, we should have patented that. And so they basically sent out a company-wide mission across all of George's companies, which is, we want to evaluate all of the cool new technologies that y'all are developing across all these companies for their patent potential. And so they had a very high powered uh, lawyer from LA who was leading that effort. And he, uh, when he caught wind of what we had done with iMuse, his, his ears perked up. He was like, this, this is a home run. This is a really huge innovation. And so he, he made sure we, we did a patent on that. And it was a very good patent. I mean, the, he was really good at distilling out the essence of, of what was innovative about it. So I, I think it was, I, but I ultimately, obviously, I don't believe Lucas ever, you know, pursued any infringement or anything on that. I think it was, you know, just one of those things that they did. And that was that. Moving on to Monkey 2, LeChuck's Revenge. 
When you started working on Nymuse, was it always the goal to have Monkey 2 as the first game that utilizes it? Yeah, absolutely. It was literally like, uh-oh, Monkey 1 didn't have all this, you know, didn't have a musical score that, that adapted organically. We need to have one for Monkey 2. Like, we need to make sure we get this right in Monkey Island 2. That was always the plan. That was, that was the target. And how was the workload divided between you, Peter McConnell, and Kling Jakin when it came to scoring this game? Yeah, so um, when it, in, in terms of the score itself, uh, we're, you know, super tight uh, in terms of, you know, we all sort of know each other's styles and uh, can work sort of in and around what each other is doing very seamlessly. Uh, that being said, I think we we tended to, you know, in a lot of these games, we tended to divide them up by region or in this case, in something like Monkey Island, it would be islands. So each of us would take responsibility for a particular island, uh, although there were exceptions, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, some people would do little parts of an island that wasn't their island because it just made sense stylistically or whatever. Uh, and so... Um, Yeah, and so uh, that was kind of how we did things. Um, but there was, like I say, a lot of uh, give and take. Like, for example, the Largo score, I think, you know, Peter wrote the A theme and I wrote the B theme and they fit together pretty well. Uh, and, you know, there were a number of other places in the game where, um, you know, our, our various contributions were kind of commingled and they just, they fit together pretty well. So, um You know, I, sometimes, you know, I, I, I hear some piece and I can't even quite remember who, which, which of us wrote it, you know, um, and that's, I think that's good because it just, it shows how tight we were as a team. Okay. Let's play someone Kellen too. Right. And I will say by the, well, bef it, there is one little joke, which is the very first moment in the game is silent as a sort of a joke. I don't know if anybody ever got that joke, but. The, the part before you get on the bridge and yeah. hear the Largo theme? Yeah, yeah, it's like... I got it. Oh, cool. <laughs> hey, you guys get out of here. I bust into the church and say, now you're in for it, you... So I got this in-joke. Because since the game starts, you have music wall-to-wall, -wall, like you said. You have the theme song, then you have the intro. And I think this is the only silent moment. Yep. And for me, there are two main locations in the game in which I think that the IMU system shines the most. Both are on Scab Island, and those are Woodtick and the Swamp. Yep. And no, so yep. we'll listen to Woodtick in a moment. Where do you think you're going, fancy pants? You ain't from these parts, are you? This is a dull bridge. You gotta pay. I don't pay for nothing. I'm a pirate. Tough guy. And this is the main theme. Yeah. I can't tell you how awesome this is. <laughs> Thanks. I remember playing this game on stream with uh, Paul and just entering and exiting all kinds of locations in Wutik for no apparent reason, just to hear all the musical cues. Mm. Now, in Wutik you can leave a location which requires the music to readjust itself to the main theme, and then you can swiftly enter a new location. 
and this would require the score to perform several transitions at the same time. How did you yeah how did you handle such situations? Let me try to let's see if I can recreate. So this is the theme over here. So it, it started and then if I go over here fast enough, So how, how did you handle this type of abuse exactly. to the system? We knew people were going to try to break it. And so that was precisely what we sat looking over the programmer's shoulder all those hours, you know, figuring out ways to stack up the commands so that they would get sequenced in the right timing and eventually get you to the right place. It was, yeah, we needed to make it bulletproof. We knew that. <laughs> So if you can reach a situation in which you have several exit transitions and one intro transition, it will play all of them in the correct spot. Yeah, I believe with the so. With the intro transition ending that stack of actions. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Awesome. Now we go to over here. Let's go visit the swamp. Great. Oh yeah, that was another piece, by the way, that Earwax did in the original Monkey One, was the swamp, the voodoo lady music. Unlike Wootik, in which you needed to enter a location in order to hear the changes in the theme and the, the additional themes. Over here, I think there are several milestones in Guybrush's journey up to the swa up to the voodoo lady in which it starts playing new instruments. So for example, so for example, you hear this is the main theme. And when you enter the coffin, you have one additional instrument. And when you pass the tree, you have another one. So now you have the bass line. And when you get to the skull itself, then it pauses for a second because it needs to play the, the ending of this uh, musical cue. And it waits for a sec and it plays this. Yeah. So first of all, this is so awesome. And, and, and I honestly don't understand why no one talked about it on, in reviews and such or gave, or gave any attention to it back in the day. Now, in the game, there are certain locations in which Guybrush can enter a location without any pauses, like we saw in Woodtick. And in that new location, it takes a few seconds for the musical cue to align correctly with the timing, and then it starts playing. Like, again, in Mutik, you can access uh, a location, and the music changes after you enter that location. But in other locations, Guybrush needs to wait until the musical cue kicks in, and only then does the scene transition, like we saw with uh, Skull. And he had to wait on the platform until the musical cue played, and then and he got into the, the Voodoo Lady hut. How was the decision made regarding which locations required perfect sync between the music and the scene and which allowed for the music to adjust after entering the location? I think it really had to do with the animation, like that, that you know, the, the mouth opening, lifting up the, the canoe is such a, you know, striking animation and, and, the, and that horn stabs fit with it so well that it was like, let's, you know, go through the effort of actually slowing down the gameplay in order to make the musical moment and the gameplay align. It takes a lot to be able to justify that because, you know, you want to keep the gameplay moving. But in a few cases like that, it just seemed worth it. Um, and generally, though, when when you're just switching positions or you know going into a room, for example, the speed at which the music changes depends 
on how close you are to one of those boundaries that I mentioned. So if if it happens to be right before one of those boundaries when you go into the room, then you'll get the change really quickly. But if you go into the room right after one of those boundaries, then you're going to have to wait all the way to the next boundary before the music changes. So it's it's very much uh, you know random. But overall, it, as long as it's close enough within a, you know a few beats, it usually makes the point pretty well. Now, interestingly enough, in the Monkey Island 2 demo, there are quite a few tracks that were not used in the final game. And I want us to go over two of these tracks, which were from Scab Island. So they were probably created by you. Okay, so we have this one, which is the... Like it says over here, the the other melodies from Wootik, the Bar, Wally, Laundry, and Woodsmith sound more like identical, but this one is missing from the final game. Why was this changed? That's really interesting. Um, I I don't remember specifically, but listening to that, it might very well be the prototypical piece for all those other pieces. I'm I'm educated guess would be that you know when it came time to write a melody for woodtick that's what i wrote and then you know when it came time to put that melody into each specific location i derived a variation of this tune for each of the locations but but the original tune wasn't written with any of those locations in mind so you know it makes sense to put it in a demo but it didn't actually have a place in the game and the second track is the Krypton Cemetery. This is so badass. Why did you leave it in? Well, I think the cemetery theme is in there in a different form, right? I think. Yeah. But this mm -hmm. tune, this doesn't have any drums, for example. This is, I think this was the, again, the, the early sketch. Because you remember the, the, the demo stuff was stuff that got put out well before the game shipped. And True. so, yeah, I think this would be the, uh, you know, the original rendition of that tune sort of work in progress, so to speak. Uh, and yeah, it's cool. I like it. <laughs> Even wor your work in progress sounds better than a uh, game soundtrack nowadays. So, oh, thank you, thank you. Now, can you discuss the constraints of iMuse, if any, and how those influenced game design or development decisions in in this game? Um, in Monkey Two, uh, let's see. You know, the, the funny thing about it is that the, the system was built on, a, on, on some primitives, primitive, you know, system exclusive messages that really, I mean, obviously it, it couldn't write melodies off from scratch. So it wasn't like algorithmic music or anything. So, we, you know, it had those, that limit, but basically as far as being able to you know, reshuffle and regurgitate and, and connect up, you know, composed music in different ways. It didn't really have any limitations. And so the what we did is we we thought, oh, we can do all this stuff. And we ended up biting off 
almost more than we could possibly chew. It, 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 like I say, it got pretty stressful toward the end there because we had, you know, set all these balls in motion because we could, because it didn't really have limits. It was like kid in the candy store, let's do it all. And, you know, but then when the rubber hits the road, you actually have to dial it in and tune it up and, you know, get it to, you know, be bulletproof like we talked about. So, the, the biggest constraint was time by far, like time, the ability, you know, the time available to uh, create variations and create, you know, different um, transitions at incredible, you know, in increasingly granular detail, like the, the, the it could go, the, the system could get as detailed as you had time for, but time was the limiting resource. Moving on to 1992. The first version of the Secret of My Calendar I played was the 1992 CD-ROM version. This was before I even had a sound card. So basically, I played this technological marvel in complete silence until I decided to check out what would happen if I stick my headphones into the headphone jack of the CD-ROM drive. And lo and behold, I could finally listen to the iconic soundtrack while playing the game. So this was my first experience of having Sound Blaster quality audio on my computer without having a sound card. Right. At, at what point did the concept of creating a CD version of the Secret of Monkey Island with CD audio come up? I can't remember exactly, but I do remember in those early days, I think it was... Um, yeah, the idea was you would load the game from the CD and then just play the CD like an audio CD while the game was playing and you would go to different tracks. So in, in some ways, I think it was, you know, similar in terms of just the start stop nature uh, that we had back in, in Monkey One where, you know, but again, it was at least you had the quality of, of the soundtrack because you could, you know, obviously play what was called at the time Red Book Audio, which was, you know, CD, CD quality audio. Uh, I don't remember the specific origination of it, but I just remember it was, it, it came along. Yeah, now we're doing a CD. Okay, great. And by the time the CD version was out in 1992, iMuse was readily available for you to utilize why did you choose to go with CD audio instead of enhancing the musical experience using iMuse? Well, because, uh, you know, the, that would have required essentially completely redoing the score and the music engine in the game and the, uh, you know, integration of the music into the game. It, it would have been basically doing to Monkey One what we had, you know, just gotten through the ringer on with Monkey Two. And there was no, you know, no no resources or appetite to do that. I mean, this was considered at the time, I think, you know, kind of a port, right? Where it's just kind of like you take the existing game and you put it out in a new uh, medium or a new platform. And so it fit pretty well with the existing game because the existing game had, you know, start and stop music loops. And that's what we could do with Redbook Audio. And so it was really just a matter of, um, you know, the shortest distance to get it out the door was to just, you know, recreate uh, in this new format, what was done previously without changing the content in any way. And was the CD audio just a recording of the Roland MT32? I can't remember, but I'm guessing, or I can't imagine we would have done anything but that, because that, that would be the only thing that would make sense. Oh, well, that's why I'm here. Let's play some Monkey Island one. Great. Original music by Michael Land. And you know, this theme that still gives us goosebumps for over 30 years, 
is something that you've written in 15 minutes. So yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now we can hear some ambient sounds. Yeah. Was the idea to have ambient sounds as part of the CD soundtrack something that was conceived early on during the production of the CD version? Or was it something that you felt was required given that there were locations like this one that lacked any musical score? I'm pretty sure it was early in the production. I can't remember exactly, but you know, it would have made sense that people would have said, hey, you know, we have this all this CD-ROM space available, let's use it for background sounds because it would just add ambience and it makes a lot of sense. Meanwhile, Deep beneath Monkey Island, the ghost pirate LeChuck ship lies anchored in a river of lava. Captain LeChuck, sir, I... Ah, there's nothing like the hot winds of hell blowing in your face. No, sir. Nothing like it. Ah, <laughs> uh, sir... I... It's days like this that make you glad to be dead. Oh, yes, sir. Glad to be dead. <laughs> we are glad to be dead, right? Oh, yes, sir. I, I feel so lucky that you happened to capture my ship that murdered me and everyone on board. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Lucky. Glad to hear it. Now, what was it you disturbed me for? Uh, y yes, sir. Well, you see, we might have a problem on Melee Island. Problem? What possible problem could there be? I've got those sissy pirates so scared of the sea, they're afraid to take a bath. Well, there seems to be a new pirate in town. Actually, he's a pirate wannabe. <laughs> Young inexperienced. Probably nothing to worry about. Don't know why I bother you with it. <laughs> I'll have him taken care of myself. Wait! I'll handle this personally. My plans are too important to be messed up by amateurs. Yes, sir. So, this theme was written while you were peeing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Somehow it seems fitting for this theme. I don't know why. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes when ideas come to you uh, in the shower, like, like I said, then you try to make sure that you don't forget them. So you keep repeating the words or whatever. Yeah. So that you won't forget once you come out of the shower. But how does it work with music? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, you know, if you're at a keyboard, you can keep playing it. If if it's just in your head, you can just keep humming it and get to a keyboard and start playing it and uh, maybe record it if you have a recording device. But, you know, uh, I, 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 I shudder to think of, of how much good music I've imagined and forgotten because <laughs> I forget a lot. So, yeah. Um, but uh it, it that is a real challenge actually it's it's always great if you're improvising with, with a with a recording happening because then you know you get everything and you can filter it later uh 
but a lot of times that's not the case. And so you just, you just, sometimes though, you know, if, if, if something just like, if your awareness picks up on something being like, whoa, that's pretty cool, or that really fits what I need right now, you tend not to forget it because it, it's just one of those things. It's important to, to remember be, and so you remember it. It's, it's really noticing it is the, is the key and, and, you know, being, a, being aware enough to know that that's, something that is worth capturing. That's, that's really what makes the difference between it just passing away versus actually, you know, grabbing it and doing something with it. And by the way, I noticed that, that, um, I'm uh, that and I, listening to that CD-ROM. I'm pretty sure that was um, music where we gave the MIDI files to Earwax and then they uh, dressed them up with synthesizers in, in their studio. So I think that's where that music actually came from. So it's not a uh, Roland MT32. Definitely not. It's definitely mm -hmm. not the original uh, Roland MT2, MT32 versions. It is clearly a rework because in that like Chuck theme and also in the, in the main theme, it's, it, you know, I could definitely tell that it's not the Roland. And, and actually, in the Lechuk theme, they 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 I remember now uh, it rang a bell that Earwax came up with all these cool variations of a Lechuk melody because in Monkey One, the original, it was just a single loop that always the same version of the melody. But in what you just heard, they're always doing these little sort of quirky little angular variations of the mm -hmm. melody, which are very cool. So I remember at the time being like, wow, they really pulled some neat ideas out of that. Yeah, but it's based off of your work. It is, yeah. It, it has the same feel. They, they kept true to that, for sure. Moving on to Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. How was the workload divided between you, Peter McConnell, and Clint Bajakian when it came to scoring this game? I think, uh, again, we did different sections, but I think my, my parts were smaller than theirs. I think uh, they did... Um, probably each did twice as much of that game as I did. I remember, I think I did the Azores. I did uh, some of the stuff at the end with some of the lava stuff. Um, you know, uh, I think Clint was the one who repurposed the Indiana Jones theme. I think, you know, Peter did a ton of stuff. So I, I think they, they, they did between the two of them, the lion's share of that game. And I had a few, you know, nice contributions here and there. And by the way, it was absolutely great working with Hal Barwood. Um, he is such a, uh, so insightful about the relationship between music, voice, and visuals, and, you know, the three main elements of visual storytelling. And he just has such a deep understanding of, you know, how they fit together and reinforce each other and are different parts of one thing. It was real pleasure working with him. The CD-ROM version of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis was released a year after the release of The Secret of Monkey Island on CD. But in the indie CD version, the music was still in MIDI format and not CD audio. Was that the case because iMuse won't translate well in CD audio? Yeah, I, I think it was that combined with the uh, duration of the music. <clears throat> I think we probably had... Um, well over, uh, you know, 60, 70 minutes of music. And that's the maximum that you can fit uh, on a CD-ROM uh, as Redbook Audio. Uh, and so, but also because it was iMuse and because, you know, it had been, uh, you know, coded so integrally into the gameplay, uh, there was really no way to uh, split that out into start-stops of individual, you know, CD-ROM tracks without just completely, first of all, having to do all the work of reworking it. And second of all, having a result that didn't um, meld with the game nearly as well. So it made, made sense in that case to do it that way. And the game itself offers three different paths. How did you adapt the music to suit various choices players could make in these paths between the three of you? Yeah, I don't know that. I think I think the gameplay defined that for us. I think that um, we were not super conscious of which path we were on, uh, it, other than the fact that I think the different paths had you know different game situations that you could get in. So we would just have to score each situation as as its own situation. But of course, that made the game a lot bigger than it would otherwise have been. Like it, you know, it kind of ballooned the overall production of the game. So 
you know, it was a big game. <laughs> it had a lot of different parts. Yeah, it um, took 18 months. Yeah, yeah. Could have created three games in 18 months. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's an Israeli composer named uh, Nisim Khalifa, who's taken upon himself to orchestrate the entire soundtrack of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. No kidding. Wow. Yep. I would love to hear that. And we will hear that. Oh, cool. Okay, so these are all of the tracks. Let me know which one would you like to hear. We have the Lava Room. You want the Lava Room at the Oricalcum yeah, Factory? Let's try Lava Room. So he took it upon himself to recreate the entire soundtrack, like every track he worked on it for a year. Every time, every couple of weeks, he'd release another track. And he finished the entire thing like a couple of months ago. Unbelievable. I, I, if you can remember to send me a link of this, I'd love to peruse it at, at my leisure because this, this would be a lot of fun to check it out. Yeah, this nice work. I I can, yeah, that's great. Wow. Hey, would you like to hear another track, maybe? Yeah, I, let's try the Azores if they have something called the Azores. I remember, I, I think that was one that I, I did, but I, I can't remember what it would be called for sure, if that's what it would be called. But um, The Azores. So as you can see, we take LucasArts very seriously over here in Israel. Yeah, wonderful. Gosh, I haven't heard that that since I wrote it. That's re really fun to hear. And uh, it reminds me a little bit stylistically of the cabana music in um, Curse of Monkey Island. So mm -hmm. it's just funny how different things connect. But yeah, thank you. Moving on to 1993. In this promo video from 1993, there is a musical cue that I haven't heard in any of the LucasArts games. So I wanted to know if it was created specifically for this promo video. 
or was it an unused track from a game? Let's, let's listen. You'll be of no use, freelance police. So, Dr. Jones, you fit right into my trap. You'll fry like a pork sausage. You can't stop me. What possible harm could one insane mutant tentacle do? I feel like I could. <laughs> like I could. Take on the world. Jeez, what a grump. So do you know this musical, I think? Yeah, I think I wrote that. I think it's, is this like a promo video with a bunch of different games? Yeah. Yeah. Can you play the very ending of it? The ending of the promo? Yeah. Okay. You just forward ahead to the end. Work here is done. Now we can go home. Yeah. Or maybe a little earlier. Like there's one moment I wanted to re remind myself of. A couple, like maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a, it was like a compilation of all the different games, and I remember they just, yeah I just I just scored it for that particular promo. So they asked you to create a specific score for the promo itself. Yeah. Couldn't they just use something from the games? No, because it it kind of had an arc to it. It had to sort of uh, it had to sort of fit the overall flow of of the sequence and so yeah it was a custom piece of music for that i remember that wow awesome as usual mm, thank you moving on to star wars x-wing although this wasn't your the first flight sim you were credited on it marks the first one where you're credited for imuse now unlike adventure games which have a relaxed pace in which the IMU system can take its time to switch back and forth between the various musical cues, X-Wing was a flight sim in which things can happen instantaneously. Were there any adjustments that had to be made to the IMU system to accommodate this type of game? This was, we were definitely in the states and sequences modality for this one. I remember the actual... Um, layout of the of the states it was like you know four on the bottom and then three was like a little pyramid of buttons that represented the different levels of intensity and uh the um so the 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 music technology part was you know pretty well established and not really uh in need of any reworking because it just it, it it did the job but the the thing I remember that was really challenging was the musical style, uh, because it, you know, the um, you know John Williams obviously is you know beyond a master. He's just unbelievable, and uh, that was the the literature that we were we had to base the score on. I remember, you know, I, I for one took a, 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 you know, a 10 minute section of Star Wars music from an orchestral score and I rendered it in MIDI just to start to get some understanding of, you know, how he did things. And it's just, his, his, his writing is so uh, sophisticated and yet so fluid and natural sounding. It's, it's really amazing. And so the trick was then to take that style and chop it up into little bits that could be, um, you know, shuffled essentially and transitioned so that you could uh, track the energy of the game. So you had, you know, uh, obviously the different states of, of intensity, which was um, not just intensity in one direction, but also are you winning or are you losing? Are you, you know, feeling triumphant or are you feeling like, oh my God, you know, I'm in despair. Uh, so that was like a, a two-dimensional array. Uh, and then layer on top of that, uh, events of like a big thing that was good or a big thing that was bad or a small thing that was good or a small thing that was bad or finally, okay, I won this round or I lost this round. So you had, that was sort of the framework. And then the trick was to take, you know, the music and, and fit it into that framework. And uh, so, you know, I remember 
we had this, like, just as an example, um, uh, you know, and by the way, I, I think Clint was was a really, really helpful. I, I did a lot of the work on this. Uh, Clint did a lot of the work. I, I know Peter did a bunch, but I, don't, I, I remember that in particular, Clint really uh, um, helped get some of my parts over the hump because I was really struggling. Uh, and uh, so there were these things, for example, called we called them sim dims. They were, you know, there's parts in the uh, climax of the original Star Wars movie where, you know, he's like doing the trench run and there are these symmetrical diminished scales is what they're called. It's these very sort of um, unstable sonorities that are very symmetrical in their, in their note choices, like a whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, never roots on any chord. It's just sort of floaty. And so we took that particular texture from the trench run music and came up with a whole bunch of different variations of it so that we could, you know, essentially juggle little bits of it in, in, in order to make it have this sort of endless variation quality. And so that's just one example of sort of the hoops we had to jump through in order to, you know, take that iconic music and actually make it, you know, function in an interactive modality. Very, very difficult, very challenging. So with licensed IPs like Indiana Jones and Star Wars, you probably had less creative freedom than the other LucasArts IPs. How did you approach the creation of new musical scores in a way that would fit right into the lore of Indiana Jones and, and in this case, Star Wars. So those are actually two very different cases because with um, <clears throat> Fate of Atlantis, uh, obviously there are the um, iconic moments where the Indiana Jones theme kicks in. Uh, but then you have this giant expansive game with all these locations and all these sort of things where, you know, we were basically on our own for that. We had, we did have the creative freedom. Obviously, it had to fit the, the the game's dramatic moment. But you know, you have as much creative freedom there as you would with any, you know, scoring of of music for picture. Whereas with the Star Wars game, with X Wing in particular, um, we we stayed a lot closer to the original score. Right. So it was it was less of, okay, we'll do the main theme and then do whatever we want for the rest of the game. And much more of, okay, Johnny Williams created this incredibly energetic musical mechanism, this sound that just is propulsive. <clears throat> and we want to take that and essentially, you know, clone it 35 different ways that can all fit together based on the gameplay. And so it was a much more you know, targeted effort to get exactly the sound that he got, but in an interactive version. So what you're saying is that if Indiana Jones would have been any other game, then 90% of the soundtrack would still be the same as it is right now? Pretty much, yeah, because, you know, there was only maybe, yeah, 10% that was, you know, specifically derived from the Indiana Jones uh, literature, uh, from, you know, those iconic moments. But, um, you know, Star Wars, we were going for 100% John Williams. Moving on to Day of the Tentacle, how was the workload divided between you, Peter McCall, and Clint Bajakian when it came to scoring this game? Uh, this was another one where Peter and Clint did the lion's share of it, the vast lion's share. I, <clears throat> I think we divided it up by time period, and I think I did the future, if I'm not, I can't remember for sure. Uh, again, you know, we try to find some logical aspect of the game to divide up. Uh, so in, in, you know, some games it's by geographical location, like, uh, uh, but in, in the case of um, Day of the Tentacle, it was you know, there were three different time periods. And so that was an, a, a natural way to divide it up. And again, uh, I, I did, you know, my time period, I think was the smallest of the, of the three. And so, um, I didn't <clears throat> do as much, but then of course, on top of that, uh, Peter and Clint together did the, uh, amazing, uh, you know, Looney Tunes style opening sequence that was just so huge and so fun and so crazy. And they, they did that pretty much themselves. It's a good thing that LucasArts followed the rule of three after Ron Gilbert 
created the three trials in Monkey Island, and then you had the three islands in Monkey Island 2, and then you had the three paths in Indiana Jones, and in Day of the Tentacle, you had three timelines. So that's right. It was perfect yeah. for three composers. Exactly. It worked out great. And do you have any anecdotes regarding your work on Day of the Tentacle, regarding specific scenes or characters? Uh, I think I, I did the, the Hoagie character, the theme for him. Um, I remember it was a very grim sounding theme in his room. I don't remember it specifically. Uh, but, <clears throat> I, you know, that was one of those ones where, you know, at the time I was kind of managing the department more and it was very hard for me to get the focus uh, to do, you know, uh, big chunks of composing work. And so, um, thankfully Peter and Clint did a bang up job on that one. And, you know, I contributed just little bits here and there and it was a, it was a struggle you know, earlier I mentioned I, I, about the, when the juices are flowing, but I remember that, you know, around that time, the juices were not flowing and it was a real struggle for me to compose. Since it's November, 2023 right now. This means that Seven Max celebrated its 30th anniversary. Seven Max hit the road, of course. So I'll start off by asking, how was the workload divided between you, Peter McConnell, and Clint Pajakian when it came to scoring Seven Max hit the road? Uh, I don't think I did much, if anything, on Seven Max hit the road musically. Um, I know, uh, I, I know. Peter did a, a lot. I'm pretty sure that it was, you know, largely Peter, but and I think Clint was was in on it too. I don't remember specifically, but I think it was basically the two of them. You're credited for music and sound programming. Yeah, the sound programming would have been the iMuse system that was used, and that was sound programming I had done years earlier. So I don't think I did a lot of actual sound programming. And I probably wrote uh, a tune or two uh, on Sam and Max at the Road, but I can't remember specifically which ones. And I just definitely remember that, you know, my involvement was very small. Okay. Moving on to Rebel Assault. On Rebel Assault, which also celebrated its 30th anniversary this month, you're credited for sound advice. And what I've been trying to figure out all these years was whether or not this was supposed to be a play on words, or if you actually provided sound advice about sound. I think a little bit of both, actually. Um, yeah, I can, you know, I can tell you what the non-sonic sound advice would have been, uh, which was, um, so early on, Vince Lee, he was hired in as, 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 a, as a tools programmer. He was, you know, doing essentially uh, tools work. And I remember uh, at, at one point he was working on video compression and uh, he had, uh, come up with, I, I forget what the, um, insane, insane was the name of it. Yeah. And, uh, I forget what the, uh, video source material was, but he showed this demo of, of like flying through these canyons, like an X-wing flying through these canyons. And, uh, the sound advice that I offered which in some ways was kind of the, the nugget that turned it into a game was I was like, Hey, you know, when you're flying by this Canyon, uh, you know, flying along this Canyon and you see this other Canyon off to the side that you're not flying down. What if when you came to that spot, it could fork and you could pick which Canyon you were going to fly down. Um, and that was the, the introduction of interactivity into that video compression algorithm. And that became the sort of basic framework of the game. And so, uh, he did, he did in fact code that up. Vince was an amazing programmer. Um, and, uh, it was cool. It was like, Whoa, you're flying along and all of a sudden you can decide which way to go. And, and folks were like, let's make a game out of this. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was my advice. <laughs> and it was sound. And it was sound. <laughs> yeah. Dark Forces, which came out in 1995, was the first first-person shooter game to utilize iMuse. 
what changes, if any, had to be made to iMuse to make it compatible with the even faster paced action of a first person shooter? Again, I think it was the system itself was perfectly suited right out the gate. I mean, you know, having done X-Wing, it was, you know, it had shown that it could operate in that kind of format. Uh, the, um, I, I, I think if I remember correctly, did they use actual Star Wars music for that game? Or was it, uh, you know, it was MIDI based. It was MIDI based. Okay. So that was, I think Clint did most of that work. And, uh, so I don't think I was involved very directly in, uh, in working on the music for that game. But again, I think that the system, you know, we were always refining it. We were a lot, a lot of times we were refining the tool set, the ability to audition things and all that. But I think, you know, for the most part, uh, after Monkey 2, when we had added that extra layer, I think it was pretty uh, pretty stable uh, for the rest of the time um, until we got around to like doing streamed digital music. And I guess that was sometime after that. Yeah. So, for example, you said that in Woodtick, you had 150 endings, 150 possible endings to various locations. So in order to make it work in faster paced games, then you would have to have, I don't know, 300 endings, 400 Yeah, endings. no, we didn't. No, it wasn't that it was, no, the musical, that was a musical style that was very melodic. And uh, in a faster paced game, um, when you're, it, it be, it's a little bit, it's less melodic, right? Because when you have a longer melody, and if you're part of the way through that melody, uh, and you have to exit that melody, it seemed worthwhile, although only in that one place and never again, uh, to write a special ending for each moment that you might want to exit that melody. Uh, but um, in general, we didn't do that. In general, you know, we would... Um, uh, just pick a downbeat and jump to something that was derived from the texture that sort of could interrupt the melody in a way that seemed convincing. Uh, and so that was basically the way that pretty much everything else worked after that. So, you know, in a faster paced game, the music itself would, would have more energy. If it has more energy, it probably means that the beats are going by quicker. If the beats are going by quicker, that means that you have less time between each of those jump points. So that's what makes it relatively natural for it to respond more quickly is the, the nature of the music itself is more frenetic. And so, you know, the more frenetic the music, the more opportunities you have to change direction without it seeming like a break. On Full Thrall, which also came out in 1995, you're credited as, you know what your credit is? Uh, sound programming? Mr. Big Music Guy. Oh my God. <laughs> what does the role of Mr. Big Music Guy entail? Yeah, that basically just meant I was managing the department that, that did all the work and I didn't do any of the work myself. <laughs> Um, but I believe that was the first game where um, iMuse was actually uh, doing digital, you know, streaming and not, you know, or was it Redbook? I can't remember. Um, so what changes had to be made to iMuse to turn it from a MIDI-based interactive music system to a system that supports digital audio? Yeah, that was uh, tricky. I remember that was, that was a... Uh, a change that required essentially, um, uh, and it was the same thing for the dig, which was you, basically you had to stream the audio uh, from disc and have for every piece of music that was a digital audio file on disc, there was a corresponding MIDI file that had the same duration that contained the system exclusive messages. 
And both of them got played in parallel. And that was how you could align the system exclusive messages with the digital audio content. So you still use the MIDI format in order to know the locations where you could flip between the musical cues? Yes. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what we did. Yeah. Why didn't you base it off of a timer of sorts? Like in this, in the that's 50th what second? Is. That's what MIDI is. I know, but you don't have to use MIDI. You can just use the, the CPU clock to count the seconds from the beginning of the... Well, we had all the tools all, all built up already. So we, we were trying to just work with, uh, you know, the, the tool set that we had and the techniques and the, you know, approaches we had. Because remember, we had the MIDI and then we had, you know, the system exclusive. And then we had this other layer on top that pulled the puppet string. So we wanted to keep all of that as intact as possible. And all we wanted to do was at the very bottom, instead of playing MIDI notes for the notes, we would play digital audio for the notes, but keep everything else the same. That was the path of most direct, you know, completion. So it was an empty MIDI file with the markers for the transitions and that's it without actual music on it. That's right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's how we did it. Now we're getting to the masterpiece soundtrack that I've been listening to daily for the past 20 years. The Dig. Wow. Oh my God. Thank you. So let's play the Dig. Of course I miss you, darling. This is the loneliest place on earth. The most exciting thing ever happens here is the day when it don't rain. Uh, excuse me, darling, I got some work to do. Get on in here, Pete. We got us a big old asteroid on a three-week collision course with Earth. So the reason I've been listening to it daily for the past 20 years is because ever since the game was released, like uh, I think two or three years after the game was released, it no longer supported modern systems. And only in 2003, emulators started coming out so I could start playing the game again. And what I used to do is I'd start up the game and I'd have save games from different locations in the game. And I'll just put it in the background and listen to the music on my uh, computer speakers. Since then, I, are, I have the soundtrack and I've been listening to it, that, but uh, hearing it in the game is uh, it's quite an experience. So I, first of all, I wanted to thank you for creating such a marvelous soundtrack that I've been listening to for the past couple of decades. And as you are well aware, the game had four different iterations with the final one being the shipped game. Were you tasked to work on any of the previous iterations? Uh, I think the one before that uh, final one, if I remember, that was the one with Brian Moriarty. And I think I did a, uh, a promo score for that one, which kind of became the germination for the sort of the main thematic material on the final game. So speaking of the promo, let's watch the promo. Yeah.
You are Commander Boston Lowe, NASA's best shuttle jockey. You've been enlisted to command a space shuttle mission to correct the orbit of an errant asteroid. No one could prepare you for what would happen next. Was this the musical score you're talking about? That's, that's what I was talking about, yeah. Yep. And the, yeah, the game was also... You had other voice actors voicing the characters. Robbins, this place is incredible. I can't believe what we found. If we ever get home, what a story will I mean, have. this is not Robert Patrick, of course. Right. Maggie, you okay? Just fine. So this was this was the score you created for the Brian Moriarty version. I thought it was Brian, but maybe maybe this was Sean. I might have. I, I think actually what it was was I wrote that piece of music that you just heard for Brian, but I maybe it never got put into anything, and it was just sitting around. And then when it came time for releasing this, um, I was like, well, let's just grab that and and you know put it in as appropriate. And then this section here, by the way. Uh, this was a uh, studio session I did with uh, somebody uh, I went to Mills with named David Brown, who um, knew how to turn a studio into a, a, a resonating body. Like he, he managed to like tune all these effects loops, all these delay loops and all these feedback, like rerouting stuff. And then he just got the whole studio to just kind of resonate in this complicated way. And we've just recorded a bunch of it. And that's the sound you hear here. Now, while many LucasArts games feature numerous characters in various locations, the, the dig mainly follows Boston Lowe, who most of the time navigates alone on this deserted planet. Could you elaborate a bit on the challenges you face while trying to compose music that conveys these themes of solitude and exploration? <laughs> Boy, um, the funny thing is that... Uh, Don't tell me. You went to the bathroom and the entire <laughs> soundtrack was ready. No, no, nothing like that. But, but you know, the funny thing is that um, I guess solitude and isolation must be, you know, uh, some, some deep state inside of me because this, this music really came from as, as far inside of myself as, as any music I've written. And, uh, you know, it really felt like I was expressing... In, in many ways, my point of view, my, my, my internal state in, in writing this music. So I didn't really have to struggle with uh, trying to capture the feelings uh, because I, I had those feelings. And so I was able to just, you know, evoke them. You evoked them perfectly. Thank and you. can you highlight any specific musical techniques or instruments you use to create the otherworldly soundscapes in the game? Yeah. I mean, certainly what I just mentioned about that studio feedback resonation was, was one, but there was actually something else that was uh, extremely um, powerful, which is uh, somewhere along the line, we determined that, hey, let's, you know, release a soundtrack on Angel Records. And and then it was like, you know, Angel Records has this great big catalog of music and somehow we got the rights to use, uh, they had this one recording of Wagner overtures and uh, we got the rights to that. And, and so what I did is I went through, you know, basically an hour's worth of, of Wagner orchestral music and I found every moment where there was a resonating chord, just some burbling resonating chord of all kinds of different uh, energies in all kinds of different keys. And I just snipped them out. And I had a folder uh, on my Mac full of, you know, hundreds of chords labeled by what chord it was. Uh, 
and I ended up composing pieces of music that were kind of, you know, slow chord changes with slow moving melodies on top. And then I would take those snippets of Wagner and I would mix them underneath the synthesizer music that I had written following the chord progression. So you might have a chord from one overture leading into a different chord from a completely different piece that, you know, just naturally transitioned. And and that was what gave it that sort of that body, that sort of otherworldly under the surface kind of, you know, rumbling depth. You can't beat Wagner for that. And in the game, you're also credited for ambient sound. How did you approach your work on that? I think that would be that studio stuff that I, that I mentioned. That would be, uh, you know, where the ambient sound came in because that was really, you know, a lot of the ambiences, I mean, that had so many different characters over the course of like recording it for an hour. It went through so many different personalities that, uh, you know, we just cut in the parts that, um, seemed appropriate for any given setting. Uh, and it really, um, again, very otherworldly between that and the Wagner, there was a lot of, uh, you know, differentness to the score other than just what you would get from a MIDI synthesizer. And were there any specific science fiction movies or movie scores or, or artists apart from Wagner who influenced your approach to the Diggs music? Interestingly enough, do you know a composer uh, by the name of Alan Hovhaness? No. He's a, you know, 20th century, you know, classical quote unquote uh, composer from Seattle. Um, he wrote a piece that is kind of one of the seminal pieces in my life that really captured a feeling for me uh, called Mysterious Mountain. And um, that piece has a certain, I don't know how to say it, quasi-religious, just sort of depth and feeling to it that really resonated for me. And, you know, if, if there was any piece that, um, you know, I, I built on, it would have been that one. With the help of iMuse, all of the music tracks in the game play in a, a continuous loop. When it came time to release the soundtrack, how did you approach the creation of the beginning and the end of each one of those tracks? Yeah, it's pretty interesting because in a, in a game, uh, typically the way those loops would work is, you know, you would enter some location. And so you would have say, a, an announcement fanfare that sort of, you know, introduced you like, Oh, you're entering this location now. And then you would go into a melody that would play that would then loop that would then repeat, but in a less f big version. So, you know, a, a more sort of toned down version on the repeat and then that repeat would loop. So, cause the longer you stay there, you know, you just want to have be kind of quiet and backgroundy. And so essentially it would start big and work its way down to very little in the game. In a CD, you, it's the opposite. So you want to start so, sort of sub, subdued and then build up and build up and then, you know, get to the end of the piece and have kind of a climax and then it sort of winds down and it's done. So it's the opposite shape, so to speak. So it was really a very intense, like seven week process of essentially recomposing many of those pieces uh, in order to, uh, you know, make them flow more like a CD would flow and less like a game would flow. And I also had the um, great pleasure of working with Paul McCandless, who is an amazing uh, oboe player, um, and uh, Emily Bazaar, a great singer. Uh, and um, I think uh, Irene Caesar was in there as well, uh, violinist. I think there was uh, a lot of, you know, opportunity to, to build uh, some actual live players on top of those textures as well. So it was both the Wagner and some, some live recordings. I, I actually brought in a timpani to the studio, played live timpani. So, you know, there was a, a, a little bit of live, you know, live stuff and um, the Wagner and the synthesizer combined. I know. I remember seeing a photo of you playing those in the studio in the adventure. Yeah. I think that yeah. with the adventure that I got with the dig, 
there was either an article about you or an article about the, the LucasArts soundtracks and there was that photo of you. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. On Outlaws, which was released in 1997, you were credited for being manager of sound development. What did that role entail in this game? Yeah, same thing as like Mr. Big Music Guy, which is I was managing the team that did all the work. Uh, I don't really think I did any of the work on that myself. That was entirely Clint's score. So yeah, at a certain point, you know, I think it was starting with The Dig and thereafter, um, the composers didn't collaborate on the same game, really. We would each just take an entire game to ourselves. Uh, and although I think there were some exceptions to that at some point, but um, the uh, so Outlaws was entirely Clint and he nailed it. You know, he based the uh, Ennio Morricone sound, uh, his score on the Ennio Morricone sound. And we had a, at that point, we had a nice studio uh, in the LucasArts facility. So he was able to do all the live recording that you know, is necessary to capture that spaghetti Western feel. And he really got it. He, he just, you know, Clint has an amazing um, sensibility and he really brought it to the fore in that one. Curse of Monkey Island, which was released in 1997, was the first Monkey Island game which used recorded music instead of MIDI. The, the fact that you knew that all players would experience the same soundtrack regardless of their sound card, influence your composing approach in this entry? Well, certainly because, you know, you could put all of the attention into just that one version. Um, so I had uh, a couple of E4 synthesizers, which were very high-end samplers, uh, went through an ex extensive effort to sort of collect samples and dial in the samples. So I had a, a MIDI template with, you know, an orchestra and a bunch of, you know, organs, drums, you know, all the different uh, ethnic wind instruments, just sort of the whole, the whole gamut of instruments right there at my fingertips. So in any piece that I was working on, I could just pick any one of those things and, and uh, you know, compose with it on MIDI. And then, of course, there was a significant amount of live players on that one as well. Um, uh, very notably, uh, the uh, accordion player, um, incredible guy, uh, a guy named Peter Suave. We, uh, I saw him perform. So he had won an accordion competition where he had performed an extremely difficult accordion piece, solo accordion, like new music. Uh, and he just nailed it. And I was like, I want to get this guy. And so I, you know, I, I wrote some of the most incredibly difficult uh, accordion writing that you could imagine with like, you know, super fast triplets and just like, like going crazy on a keyboard. Right. And then got him into the studio, put the music in front of him. And he would like, okay, let me practice this. And he'd play it perfectly. And he'd say, okay, let's record. And then he'd play it perfectly again. But this time he was just ripping it. And it's just like, oh my God. And he did that every single piece. Like he literally never made a mistake. Uh, the guy was incredible. And so we got a lot of great, great stuff out of him. Um, I think uh, Peter played banjo for some of the, um, I think what it's called the caber toss or whatever. Um, there was a lot of fun stuff with with live players. I mean, of course, there was the band part where it's like I actually had uh, two great musicians, uh, Paul Van Vingenangen on uh, drums and David Immergluck um, on guitar, who's a guitar player with Counting Crows. And he uh, nailed, they both nailed it. I was the weak link in that particular trio, but that was the underpinning for a lot of the reggae. Uh, so it was just a, it was a lot of fun. And, oh, um, Michael Spiro came in and, and brought like a truckload of percussion and did all kinds of great percussion work. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And Curse of Monkey Island is also the first Monkey Island game to have voice acting. Did that impact your approach to composing music for this game? A little bit. Like you have to be very mindful of when there is, um, you know, when there's talking going on, you kind of have to get out of the way. Um, <clears throat> and conversely, when, you know, when there's no talking, you can take up more of the um, semantic space, so to speak, you know, because it's like, it's, there's a really different kind of writing that you do underneath talking versus when you are able to have the part of the brain that would process talking available for you to process music. You, they really are 
very similar parts of the brain, I think. And so, you know, you have to be very mindful of that. Um, so, uh, but, you know, that means just that you have to avoid melody really when, you know, or at least catchy melody when somebody's talking because that'll pull the attention away from the voice. But then when the, there's nobody talking, you can be as catchy as you want and it, and it helps, you know, toe tapping, all the, all the rest. So, yeah. So the version of Monkey Island 2 we played earlier is the ultimate talky version, which takes the voice acting from the special editions, which came out in 2000 and we played Monkey Island 2, so 2010, and implements it in the old version, the classic version. And so we got to hear the Largo theme and Wootick with voice acting. Now, do you think that if you had had voice acting back then, would you have composed these themes differently? I think probably. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, I mean, the other thing to bear in mind is that uh, you don't actually hear the dialogue during the game development process because the dialogue gets recorded after everything is completely written and you know they want to record the dialogue near the very end of the cycle because what if they change a line they don't want to have to go back and re-record dialogue so and they're always changing lines um and so uh <clears throat> you know you you're a lot of times you're flying blind as to what it's actually going to sound like when uh, you actually do get the voices dropped in the middle of a piece of music you've been writing. So you just kind of have to, you know, try to guess basically what it's going to all sound like when it comes together. And then there's, of course, finally, there's the mixing possibility. Like you can always, you know, bring the music down and bring the voice up and make it, make sure that the voice, you know, gets the prominence that it deserves. In Curse of Mike Helen, we also have a pirate I was meant to be. How did that come about? Yeah, so Jonathan Ackley, the, the project leader, um, he basically came up with a rap, a pirate rap. Um, and, you know, he wrote all the verses out. And uh, I remember thinking, you know what, this thing needs a chorus. Uh, and I actually came up with that, the, the chorus line, a pirate I was meant to be, trim the sails and roam the sea. Uh, because it was like, it, it was really brilliant, the writing, but it just needed that one thing at the end that always kind of, you know, is the same. And so, um, <clears throat> and then it was, uh, okay, let's make a tune. And so, uh, you know, I wrote the, the tune and, and um, the tricky part of that tune is uh, after each cycle, it just loops around and loops around on that one little vamp until you make a selection. And then it goes a little da -da 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 and it starts in with the melody again. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, they recorded it with, you know, pirate, like I actually did a demo of, of what it should sound like with, with singing. And then they got, you know, the guys who actually voiced those characters to, um, to do the actual singing in the studio based on my demo. And uh, the funny thing is I, or in the chorus, I had it in three-part harmony, but in the studio, they were like, we're not doing three-part harmony. We're just going to all sing the same melody line at the end and, you know, double each other. So, and it actually probably made sense because pirates might, ha might've had a little trouble in real life singing three-part harmony. It's not really their thing, you know? So I think they made the right call. It's awesome that all of this happened in the golden era of LucasArts when they could give you enough budget to do something like that, which is neither a puzzle nor something that progresses the game. If anything, in non-English versions of the game, this part was removed because in the localization themes, they didn't have enough budget to re-record the entire thing or think of rhymes or or changing everything over there so they just removed it yeah that's right it was great that they would allow that and let us do that it was really fun now in 1998 green fandango was released and again you're the sound production supervisor did you take any part in the yeah in no, something same. sound related in this game 
Now it was all the same thing. It was basically meant I was, you know, I was the guy running the, you know, the department just uh, while everybody else did the work. And uh, in, that, in this case, Peter did an amazing score for Grim Fandango. He had, you know, the studio to work with, which he used to great effect. And um, yeah, one of the one of the great scores. Escape from Monkey Island, which was released in 2000, was probably the last Monkey Island to use iMuse or even the last game to use iMuse. Was iMuse even a prominent part of the production of this game? I think, I don't think it was prominent. I think it was, you know, at that point, kind of just a routine, right? It was, you know, we had certain techniques that we used and, um, <clears throat> you know, we sort of distilled down to the most important stuff and left all the experimentation behind because, you know, at that point, it's just like, okay, we're doing digital soundtracks now. Let's really focus on, you know, making the quality of the soundtrack as high as we can. And we don't have to, you know, if we spend all our time doing little fancy, you know, 150 endings, it's going to take away from our ability to focus on quality. So, we weren't doing all of that fancy stuff. It was basic ending chunks, you know, an occasional transition, but it, it, you know, really the focus at that point was on the music. So how soon after the release of Escape from Monkey Island did you leave LucasArts? I actually left LucasArts before uh, that game really got, uh, before the music production on that game. So, um, and I think, uh, you know, Peter and I, it was really interesting. Peter and I uh, left LucasArts in the spring of 2000 uh, to do a startup. And we left Clint in charge of the department. And, uh, you know, Escape from Monkey Island was on the docket. And, you know, it was clear that, you know, uh, Peter and I would be able to, you know, write some music for Escape from Monkey Island, but not a ton. And that, probably the lion's share would have to be done by Clint. And uh, he realized that, as he put it, he made the ultimate resource allocation decision, which was he resigned as the head of the department uh, and, you know, became a consultant so that he could actually focus on writing the score for the game. So uh, that's how that came about. And what did you do after it looks starts? So Peter and I did a, a, a software startup for a number of years, trying to do with uh, sort of with visuals, kind of what we had done with iMuse, and and we we got some traction, but ultimately, uh, you know, after five or six, seven years, uh, you know, we we ran out of money and had to just go our separate ways and do other things. And in two thousand and three, you composed the music for SimCity Four. Yeah, I just did one piece and it was a really fun piece. Um, you know, it was, uh, there was an ambient requirement. It had to be sort of ambient and so, um, and long, it was like, I think five minutes long. Uh, and so I really enjoyed that one a lot. It was, you know, I, it, it, it was a piece that was like a slow burn. It sort of started out kind of gentle, but then it kind of builded and kind of had, had some, you know, some real sort of power toward the end. So it was, it was a fun piece. Tales of Monkey Island came out in 2009. What was it like getting back to the Monkey Island series after nine years? Yeah, that was great. Um, the, uh, the, you know, interestingly enough, it was, you know, full circle, like the version that I did was back to MIDI, right? Because they, uh, they, for some reason, they didn't have enough space, I guess, in, in those, or I guess it was downloadable or one of those things. But some, for some reason, it was like, oh, we don't have room for digital music. We're going to have to do MIDI music, um, which would which was different because now, you know, in the modern era there, you know, general MIDI was a, uh, a format that would allow computers to play MIDI music in a slightly higher, you know, uh, quality than, uh, what we were used to back in the day. So it wasn't that terrible, but it, there was still a lot of variation among, depending upon which general MIDI set you had on any given computer, it might be different. So it wasn't like everybody got exactly the same score. Although I think at some point they did release a CD version of it where, where someone had taken those MIDI files and converted them to, to digital audio tracks. But that was, um, 
pretty fun because, you know, I kind of knew the the style and, and the themes pretty well. Uh, and, and it was really just a, it was like a revisiting something that was very familiar and comfortable and, and warm and friendly for me. I really enjoyed working on that game. So the soundtrack was recorded in MIDI, like you said, to reduce the data size for the Wii version. But for the Windows version, they converted the music to WAV files. Yeah. And I didn't do those conversions, but I think they came out pretty well. And what modifications did you make to your workflow to accommodate the episodic nature of the, of the game? Uh, it, it really didn't change the workflow so much other than the idea that you get really five different shots out. I think there were five episodes and you, you get like a chance to take a crack at a score and then you know a few months later it's like okay take another crack at another score and you get it's like literally getting five at bats uh and so by the end i was pretty pretty comfortable with where things were you know a little rusty at the beginning and then by the end i was back in the saddle so that was kind of nice and in 2009 and 2010 the monkey island special editions were released did you did you take part in the recording of the remastered soundtracks of these special editions? Um, I didn't. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I've always um, found that the original, uh, perf you know, mid MIDI creation of anything, any kind of piece, but, you know, True Monkey Island as well as anything else, has a kind of coherence to it and it it always you know i've heard a lot of different um versions of some of the monkey island material where they took a midi file and recreated it on different equipment and when you do that e even though it can sound pretty good it, it never quite has the same blend of the parts because when you're performing it and you're in real time you have that feedback of how your touch is based on the sound of the instrument you're playing and how that instrument responds in terms of you know the velocity and the volume and the timbre you, you you get a certain coherence to it and then when you take that performance and you play it back on a different synthesizer with a different response curve things are never quite as melded together i i and and and, and even if it's a live player it's the same thing it's like there's the, it, there's something that is always, you know, it it, it 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 to me sounds like a recreation and not like an, an original coherent piece because those original coherent pieces they're very tight. They really you know it's like one musical texture without like you know the different parts being. Um, maybe this part sticks out a little too much or this part that I really like, you can't quite hear it. You know, those kinds of things happen a lot when there's a, a recreation. It's, it's not because people aren't competent. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, and, uh, you know, so I always like, you know, the, the sounds of the originals, even if they're not so much, even if the synthesizer is an older synthesizer, it has a certain integrity to it that I always appreciate. Now in 2021, you played electric bass on Psychonauts 2. Right. What can you tell us about the production of the game soundtrack, given that the, there's the documentary Psychodacy? I haven't seen that. In which we you have it? Okay. Check you that should, out. Yeah. It's, it's just 32 hours. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> I'll take that out. Um, yeah, that was wonderful. I mean, Peter called in uh, myself and Clint, and uh, I think it was just a, a tune or two uh, that he had worked up uh, that needed our, you know, our playing. Or he could have gotten anybody, but I think he he called us really for old time's sake. And it was a wonderful uh, experience. We worked in. Uh, we went to Skywalker Sound. Um, Leslie Ann Jones was the engineer, who's a just a, a, a legendary engineer. And uh, it was just such an amazing experience to be recording Peter's music with, you know, uh, uh, two other couple of amazing drummer, amazing uh, organ player and, and myself, Peter and Clint recording his tunes in that 
unbelievable facility. It was just kind of like, wow, I wish I could do this all the time. It was so fun. Um, and I'm just really glad that he, he made that happen. And how was it working with Melina Annabel that she got to mentor back in LucasArts in 1999 when you worked on Star Wars Anakin's Speedway when she joined LucasArts now as a producer on Psychonauts 2? Well, she, I didn't even know that. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't work with her directly, but I'm so glad to hear that she's, you know, doing that. That's really great. Yeah, she was a really great addition to the team. I, I really enjoyed working with her. So you didn't work directly with the producer on anything? On this, on Psychonauts, it was purely Peter. Peter was the, uh, the gateway. He basically, you know, subcontracted Clinton myself to come in and play on his tune. And, and he set everything up and we just, you know, we were there on time and everything went great. And yeah, he, Peter's really, really good at, um, you know, producing and organizing and making stuff happen. He's, he's excellent at it. And so, you know, whenever possible, I like to, uh, you know, get on a train that he's running. When were you first informed about Return to Monk Island? Uh, again, that was a Peter thing. Uh, uh, I forget, I think it would have been, I forget which year it was, but I think it was probably sometime around springtime, uh, you know, a year before we actually got to work. So I think we started work in the fall and then it, you know, we finished work in another. So if you're, if it were, if it shipped in, what was it? 21? It shipped in September 22. In September so 22. So that would have been spring of 21 that, that we first heard about it. Probably even earlier, like even maybe early spring or winter 21. Um, and uh, yeah, it was out of left field, obviously, super secret. And, uh, you know, uh, I think Clinton and I both jumped at the chance just because of the opportunity to work with Ron again and Dave. I mean, that was, you know, that was a deal sealer right there. Given that it's been 13 years since the last Monkey Island game you've worked on back then, and 31 years since the last Monkey Island game with Ron's involvement, how did you approach the creation of this soundtrack? Same as always. We divided up the islands. What else would we do, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, that worked out pretty well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I did Melee and, uh, you know, those guys did their, their islands. And we, we really, um, you know... It, again, we, we did some pieces that sort of crossed boundaries, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, Clint did the, the, the voodoo stuff on, on Melee, uh, you know, and, and that's good too, because it sort of, you know, it mixes things up a little bit. We, you know, we had different sounds somewhat. And so, you know, it brings a little bit of variety to um, have, you know, some boundary crossing. And then I think at the very beginning of the game, we all contributed that prelude section. We all contributed to it. Um, you know, Peter wrote the part that was in the, in the, you know, darkness. And then, um, uh, I, I think I did the carnival stuff and, and, and Clint did, uh, some of the stuff in, in one of the rooms there and uh, Peter did another room. So we all, you know, we all sort of started out with all three composers and then we broke off into our separate geographical areas. And, uh, yeah, it, again, it was very, um, natural for us. Like we, we kind of automatically knew kind of, um, at least aesthetically how each of us, um, uh, what what voice each of us would bring to the overall composite picture and it and it fit together really well now that we've reviewed the most of the games that you've worked on i wanted to ask you what has been in your opinion the most significant change in the game music industry since you started your career well certainly the change to digital you know delivery makes it, it's a completely different world right because when you're dealing with midi it, it really is just entirely about the note choice and the choice of different patches 
Um, so, you know, especially when it's like sound cards, like Adlib or Roland or, you know, any of that stuff, it's like everybody's working with the same very limited palette. And what you do with that palette, you know, you can put some real creativity into it, but the actual sounds themselves are the same across the entire industry. But the moment you open up, uh, you know, digital delivery, where you're delivering a waveform, at that point, you've entered the big world. At that point, absolutely any sound that you can get on tape, tape in quotes, uh, you can you can produce and deliver. And that means, you know, live players, it means advanced synthesis techniques, it means, you know, combining sound effects and music. Uh, it just, you know, you know, some some people have the 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 luxury of working with actual orchestras. It's just there's so much it, it's just basically, I mean, that transition in and of itself is by far the the most noteworthy because it's just it's the difference between you know playing in a sandbox and and being in the big world and have you ever had to alter a composition in order to adhere to certain technical limitations um you know not not so much i mean technical limitations generally aren't you know, like if things like talking like memory or things like that, not really. Um, but certainly aesthetic alterations are always required. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you obviously have to, um, uh, conform to the, um, aesthetic vision of whoever's leading the project and you take your best shot at what they're going to want. And, uh, you know, different project leaders have different degrees of uh, involvement and detail in how they, in how much guidance they provide over music. Some are just like, you know, going to want to really, uh, you know, guide the composition in terms of really specifying the emotions and, you know, the parameters. Others just say, write what you think will work. And then they tell you if something's off target, but, you know, hopefully a lot of it's on target. What advice would you give game developers looking to create a cohesive audiovisual experience in their games? Wow. Um, that is a big question. Um, I think that the, uh, it all comes down to feeling, first of all, and uh, you, you know, if your visuals are fast moving, chaotic, you know, a lot of stuff coming at you, then the music's probably going to be that way too. Um, but if it's a slower paced game with more, you say, beautiful visuals and more sort of space and more, you know, contemplation, the music will also want to be that way as well. And that kind of happens naturally because a composer is going to pick up on the visuals and, you know, come up with music that is going to hopefully align with the visuals. I mean, one thing that um, I always uh, prioritized when you know scoring a game is let me see what it looks like you know if i'm if i'm going to be trying to score a room or a scene i got to see that room i have to you know a lot of times i'll have the room up on the computer screen while i'm trying to compose the piece for it or the character up on the screen while i'm trying to compose the piece um <clears throat> i think that's there's this um subconscious way in which a composer translates looks at a visual gets the feeling of the visual and then translates that feeling into music. That, that continuity, that connection is really important. And so before you compose for a game, do you play it all the way through the version that's available at the time? To whatever degree. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've never been a, a gamer per se myself, but whenever I'm working on a game, I absolutely, you know, to whatever degree it's playable, which oftentimes early on in the development, it's not that playable, but to whatever degree you can get through it, uh, 
I, I'll play through it. Or if that's not really possible, then I'll just say, give me screenshots. Let me see what this stuff looks like. Because you want to, you want to start um, living in that world. You want to start experiencing that world and seeing how you feel when you're in that world before you try to write music for it. And have you played the final versions of the games that you composed for? Yeah, generally, you know, especially late in the production cycle, you want to play through several times as you're, you know, winding through because you always find things when you're doing those sort of late playthroughs where you didn't quite get it right as a composer and you make adjustments because, you know, a lot of times it's interesting, a lot of times <clears throat> the um, others on the development team uh, you know, sometimes music is, you know, clearly not right for a particular situation. You get some feedback on that. But a lot of times uh, there are ways in which the music is not right that wouldn't be apparent to somebody who isn't the composer or p potentially, you know, an extremely astute music uh, listener who's also a composer but didn't happen to write that music but knows how to write music. Because, because you realize things like, uh, oh, this melody is too prominent or this melody has too much of an edge. It's got to be a little bit more mellow, a little friendlier, st stuff like that, that <clears throat> you can't necessarily tell. And a lot of times you don't, especially in a game, you, you don't have the ability to calibrate those things unless you're coming from the part of the game that precedes that section, right? So if you just are in that section all by itself, maybe things seem to work. But coming out of this other section that has a particular energy and going into this new section, you might realize, oh, there needs to be an energetic shift here because the energy of the game just changed, but the musical energy didn't change accordingly. So we need to adjust that, right? That's the kind of stuff that you can only get from doing playthroughs late in the process where everything's all in place. And then you can really calibrate the movement through it, which is a big part of a game. So have you played the dig all the way through? Back in the day, yeah. Uh, not well, lately. Right. Yeah. So how do you ensure that your music contributes to the overall experience without overpowering other game elements? Yeah, again, it's everything I've just been talking about. You you have to um calibrate. You have to it's really I, that's the word I keep coming back to. It's like you you have to sort of sense is is this you know, contributing to the overall experience in the right way, or is it taking too much attention? Or alternatively, is it too weak? And the and the experience needs more from it. You know, you don't it could you could be off in either direction. And uh it's a very subtle thing because it's it's you know, you really do have to uh and then what, what you have to, in a film, there's just one path, but in a game, there's all these other paths that you can take. And sometimes you'll arrive at a room from one direction and it seems fine. Then you'll arrive at it from another direction and you realize, no, coming from this direction, it seems a little bit off. So, you know, it's not just playing through once, but sort of playing the space, so to speak, playing around in the space and following the different paths, uh, different ways to see how it feels uh, for different players. And in your opinion, what distinguishes great game music from merely functional background music? Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's two things, really. It's how, how well does it uh, conform to the energetic changes in the game? How well does it, you know, not just uh, sort of score an obvious emotion to an obvious situation, but understand that, you know, in the larger nuance of the game, this has this particular uh, place in the scheme of things and how well does the music support that. But that's sort of the music for picture uh, challenge in general. And then there's just how good is the music? You know, how do, does the music evoke really strong feelings and does it do so in a way 
that doesn't make you feel manipulated, right? Because it's, it, you know, music can be very manipulative. And I think if you follow sort of, um, you know, uh, cliche patterns that work, be, they're cliches because they work, but on some level, I think you can sense that, you know, this is, a, this is manipulating me in a cliche way versus this is making a different, a unique statement that also happens to really carry a lot of emotion. That's what, that's the hard thing is it's, it's, it's easy to make a unique statement. It's easy to, you know, carry a lot of emotion. It's hard to make a unique statement that, that carries the right emotion. That's, that's really challenging. Now you probably know the impact your music had on adventure game fans around the world. What legacy or impact do you hope that your work in game music will leave on the gaming industry? Wow. You know, honestly, I have been unbelievably surprised and gratified and am extremely grateful at, you know, the degree to which uh, people have um, resonated with, with music I've written. Uh, you know, there's a lot of um, people on uh, who've, who've done their own versions, interpretations of pieces I've written. And I listen to a lot of those and I love them. They're, some of them are just unbelievably good. And uh, so just being able to put stuff out in the world and, and have it in some cases sort of take on its own life and have people, you know, it, it doesn't just sort of follow the game, but it's had in some ways its own independent uh, existence uh, is, is unbelievable. I would never have expected that. And, you know, I, I think my hopes have, have, you know, been far exceeded many times over in terms of, in terms of that aspect of things. Now, before we conclude our conversation, I have a few questions from our viewers. Great. Anna from the classic gamers guild podcast asks, what game has your favorite music in it that you had part in? If, if the dig qualifies, it would be that for sure. I mean, Monkey Island and the dig are the two that I've, you know, really been most associated with. And I think that, you know, I love Monkey Island and there are some great moments in that, but I would say the dig is something that, you know, connects to me on a deeper spiritual level. So, I, you know, those are the two for me. And what about one you didn't have any part in? Yeah, I really was touched by Mist back in the day. I thought Mist was, you know, it, it it had a lot of qualities like what I've been talking about. It really nailed those things. And I also really loved the music for The Hobbit uh, a number of years ago, probably 10, 15 years ago, whenever that was. I thought that was great. Jan Hofmeister asks, was recording live instruments for Tales of Monkey Island soundtrack ever on the table? Not really, because it, as it was a MIDI, it was a MIDI score for technical reasons, and you know we, I wanted to have live, but it wasn't really a technical option, and so you know that was uh, the decision. But I ran with it. I I still enjoyed it a lot. Nisim Khalifa asks, "Have you ever wanted to produce an orchestral soundtrack for a video game?" I would love to. Yeah, haven't had the opportunity, but you know who knows? Maybe someday. I would very much love that. Eugene Sandalenko asks, do you miss iMuse? Yes and no. It was, uh, it was a beast, you know, it was a, it was quite a, a, an effort to maintain it and to, you know, make sure it remained, you know, bug free. Uh, by the same token, it was extremely, um, supportive of creative options. So yeah, I would, I would say on balance, I miss it. Yeah. Nisim Khalifa asks, in Fate of Atlantis, why did you decide to use Konigratzer Marsh at the end of the game when Indy places the Auric Alchem in the mouth of the robot? Was this a reference to the Last Crusade? I don't remember specifically, but I would say probably. That was probably something uh, Peter did. He's extremely uh, adept at references. And another from Nisim. Uh, in Fate of Atlantis, why was DS E-Ray incorporated into several tracks in the game, especially at the end of the game? Yeah, that was, uh, it just felt like it captured the right vibe. It was, um, you know, it that melody has such 
of a, cer a certain kind of power to it, and we wanted to tap into that power. Python Blue, the composer of Brock the Investigator, asks, how do you stay inspired? Yeah, I mean, one thing is that's killer is deadlines. Deadlines, uh, ultimately, if you're working in the games industry, you're working under deadline. And that is, you know, one thing that lights the fire. Um, but, you know, the, the other side of that, as I was talking about earlier, is is keeping the music percolating in your mind, in your body, in your soul all the time. So if you're, you know, if you're always humming new tunes to yourself, just making stuff up as, in your head as you're just going about your daily life, um, that's a really important part of keeping the juices flowing. Like I've really found that there are times when my musical juices are really flowing, when I've been doing a lot of music, other times where I've been like, say, doing software very intensely and they're not flowing. So it's about getting into a, a mind state where you're always making musical um, uh, content of any kind, tapping on your desk, anything. Uh, if you incorporate that into all of the rhythms of your life, then the music will just be naturally more flowing. Awesome. And one last question from me. What are your plans for 2024 and how can people stay in touch with you and your work? Oh, um, so I am, you know, uh, not really composing much right now. And my hope is that by the end of 2024, I will have been able to make some changes in my life to open up that opportunity again, because uh, I really, really want to be doing composing. And um, I will, uh, you know, uh, assuming God willing that I am able to, you know, find a pathway to where I can get back into that state that I've been describing uh, and uh, start generating my own music, music for music, uh, as opposed to music for picture, I'll probably just put it out on a YouTube channel at some point and start to just, you know, collect musical pieces that are my own personal statements, which is something I definitely want to do uh, while I'm still breathing. You should launch a Kickstarter campaign. I'll be the first one to back it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also, if I get Sean Clark, and I get the rights for the dig. Would you be willing to do the dig too? Absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so you're on board. I just need to get Sean and a bunch of other people. That's right. <laughs> yes. No problem. Piece of cake. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael, for taking the time to join me for a conversation today. Listening to you talk about the creation of my favorite computer game soundtracks has truly been a dream come true. Thank you, Daniel. I've really enjoyed it. Your, your, your research and thoroughness was a pleasure to interact with. So thank you very much.